Welcome, everyone. It's the June 10th, 2022 FM Disc meeting, and I'm your host, Bob Shockey. Uh, quick note, there's been a little bit of a schedule change. Uh, the two main presentations have been swapped. So um, today we have Alexis Allen of Bethlehem Design University with Start With Design, and also there's going to be some announcements, including one from the FM Disc board later. Um, but first, I'm going to be sharing a case study of how we're rethinking our discovery process at Alchemy Consulting. Um, uh, before we start, um, please mute yourself if you're not haven't done so already, so that um, accidental background noises don't distract from the presentation. Uh, and uh, if you have questions, um, uh, go ahead and, and type them in the chat and, and I'll do my best to answer them as I go. There's also going to be some time for discussion after I finish. So um, if you want to just save them for, for then, uh, that's fine too. Um, Okay, and what am I forgetting? Let's see. Um, that's about it. So I'm going to start. Let me share my screen. All right. And hide my meeting controls because they block my slides. And here we go. All right. So this is entitled Rediscovering Discovery, and my dog Ozzy is going to be helping us through this thing all the way through. Um, this is him rediscovering how much he likes to watch ducks. Uh, um, this is up at Mammoth Lakes, and uh, my uh, my daughter's boyfriend took that picture. He's an amazing uh, animal photographer. So if you um, ever need pictures of your pet, uh, his stuff's really quite incredible. All right. Um, I didn't plan on putting a promo in there for him, but it just popped into my head. So there you go. Um, like I said, I'm Bob Shockey. I'm president of Alchemy Consulting Group. Uh, it's our 23rd year in business, or at least it's my 23rd year doing, uh, doing FileMaker work professionally. Um, I've estimated, managed, and delivered many projects over the years. Um, and I've learned everything by trial and error, and I'm still learning. Um, Ozzy's... Uh, done learning about intense focus. This is him while I'm holding a ball ready to throw it. And uh, his tongue looks like that out the side of his mouth because every time he sees the ball, he freezes, his ears go down and his jaw closes. And if his mouth or his tongue happens to be hanging out the side of his mouth, guess what? Uh, it's still gonna be there. So uh, I wish I had the kind of focus he has, to be honest. Um, we're gonna discuss uh, what discovery is and why we do it. Um, discovery as an estimating tool because estimating and discovery go together. Um, some problems that we ran into with our method and uh, some new ideas that, that we came up with. Um, some resources that I found that uh, added to that and also um, sometimes confirmed my ideas were okay. Um, some challenges that we still face and where we are with our progress in implementing this because we're not done. Um, but I, I would love to uh, hear what people think of our journey as, as we go. Um, so discovery, what is it and, and why do we do it? Was the most important part of the development process. Um, I'm betting that everyone here does some form of discovery because it's pretty hard to do what we do without it. Um, and it allows us to build understanding and, and trust with the customer. I think that gets underrated sometimes, but uh, you know, I think people are sometimes a little on the fence when they start a, a software project like this. And by the time you've done discovery, I think they have a much better understanding of what the process is gonna be like and also um, what your capabilities are as, as a developer or as a company. Um, and it provides us with really essential learning and insights. This is the stuff that we need to know in order to build a great piece of software. And of course, one of the concrete things that comes out of that is a functional specification that the developer can work from and that um, the, the client can work with as well. And it provides the client with proof that we understand their needs. Um, and it's the basis for project estimate and a timeline, which those are the two things that the client, you know, the question that they always ask sometimes in your very first sales meeting with them, you know, how long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost me? Um, not necessarily in that order. And so uh, um, all of those things come together 
or come out as a result of the discovery process. Discovery comes in multiple flavors. You know, the traditional older method was, you know, the waterfall method, right? You know, do a whole bunch of discovery about the entire project from beginning to end, then build the entire project from beginning to end with varying amounts of feedback from the client. Um, the, the newer uh, methodology that a lot of people use is the agile methodology where you do everything in short sprints and, uh, and you get, you know, concrete result after concrete result building up to a whole. Um, and then there's the hybrid approach, which I suspect a lot of people here use as well, where it's kind of a mix of waterfall and agile. And that's what we do. We like to get as much info on the client and the project as we can, because we like to have a roadmap going out as far as we can. Uh, um, that sometimes informs how we're going to build things, uh, allows us to leave hooks in place that we might need for later on. Um, and some of what gets discussed might be blue sky from the client, but it's good to know what they're thinking for the future. And also, you know, when you can get them to dream a little bit and, and, and look out beyond their immediate need, then you get a better idea of kind of how they think and, and um, you know, what might be coming in the future once again. Um, and of course, discovery, you know, everything that you do, everything that you learn becomes part of your estimate. Uh, every feature has a cost. Um, you know, hours times rate equals cost in our case because we charge by the hour. I know that not everyone does, but um, nevertheless, you need to know how long it's going to take to put all these features together and, and somehow it's going to translate into your cost. Um, it can be hard to forecast. Uh, it's one of the hardest parts about this. And the overhead is even harder to estimate. And when I say overhead, I'm talking about all the stuff that's not just developing your your solution. Um, so the security, the external authentication stuff, testing, bug fixes, client meetings on an ongoing basis, um, uh, developer meetings, uh, the setting up of the server, um, device provisioning, um, like, you know, iPads and so forth. Um, all those things are, you know, extraneous stuff that's not directly a part of the development process, but it adds overhead. And how do you figure that out? That's one of the one of the things that we wanted to address. I'll be getting into that in a minute. Um, so our old method, I mean, up until now, has been has evolved has evolved over time from something fairly basic to something pretty sophisticated in a lot of ways. Um, but the the core way that it works has not changed. And that means gathering up the requirements in a series of meetings, mostly with me. Um, I brought in other people as well. Um, I, I brought in uh, uh, other people from my team uh, to be a part of that. Um, uh, mainly because I didn't want to be the only one doing it anymore. It, and it's a skill. It takes time to learn it. And uh, so um, you know, we gather up all these requirements with the client, design the system in terms of elements like Mainly the, the four ways that we would divide them up would be structural, functional, um, anything that having to do with the user interface, like a screen, and, uh, and then the uh, reports that might come out of everything that's in that area. Um, and then we would sign an estimated cost to each one of these elements. So, you know, we're going to build the screen. It's going to take 12 hours. Uh, we're going to have, you know, some tabs on that screen. Each one of those is going to take X amount of time. And we really lay it all out like that, which is fine. Um, we, you know, we'd sign a, an estimated cost to that. We would guesstimate that overhead, all that security and all that other stuff that I mentioned in hours. And we would produce an estimate based on all of that, very itemized, and we'd present it to the client. And on approval, we return it over to the developer. And just to make it a little more clear, here's uh, kind of how that structure looked. Um, so we'd have a project at the top, you know, that's just a, you know, about that as a client record than a project record. This is just in our own internal software that we use. And then we'd have a type and it would be maybe design, you know, which would be sort of the, the uh, discovery part of things. Um, development, that's pretty obvious. And then all those other overhead things, security, data migration, et cetera. Each one of those is a type and is a parent. Um, and then below that, um, you know, one type could have many modules client module, order module, inventory module. We kind of think about things, you know, in that sort of traditional sense. Um, and then below that, a thing called a feature set, which would be 
the uh, the structure, the interface, um, all that stuff that I mentioned before. Um, and then the actual requirement, right? This is the description of what that thing is gonna do, what we type up about how it's gonna work and, and so forth. And then finally below that, optionally, sometimes you wanna have a list of things that, that are components of it, like maybe a bunch of fields because that requirement is about a table or um, it's a portal and you list the fields that are gonna go in that portal or um, you know, it's a web viewer, it's gonna have these characteristics. Um, and, that, and that was our way of doing it. And this worked pretty well for a long time. But here's what didn't work about it. First of all, it's super verbose. You can end up on a big project, like let's say you're building an ERP for a pretty busy company with uh, complex rules. Um, you might be handing them a 30 page spec or a 40 page spec or more. Um, and clients won't read that. <laughs> I, I, kept, I kept hoping and thinking that they would probably for much longer than I should have but they just, they, they don't read it. They, it, their eyes glaze over when they get past page two. And, uh, and what they do is they flip to the back page to see how much it's gonna cost them because each one of those items has a dollar amount associated with it. And my rationale was, look, they can go through and they can line item veto stuff out of it if it's getting too expensive. You know, it'd be, you know, something where they go, oh no, we're, you know, we don't need this right now. But they didn't do that either. They just kind of, you know, go with it or not. Um, and so this leads to misunderstandings later on down the road. It can lead to potential cost disputes. Um, it can lead to things like, uh, you know, you know, where's this feature I asked for? And, and the answer that they'll never accept is that thing you were assuming we would build was never discussed and it's not in the spec. You didn't bother to read, but you signed. Uh, <laughs> nobody likes that answer. It may be the answer you have to give um, if things get testy, but um, you know, most of the time it doesn't, most of the time it just turns into let's solve this problem. But, um, you know, it, it's, uh, people leave things out all the time. People forget to tell you things all the time. Uh, we have a project that we worked on recently where a client asked in a meeting pretty far down the road when we were demoing uh, a particular piece of functionality for their system. Um, Wait, where's this thing? And he described the thing and we had never heard of it and we had never talked about it. And it was apparently an important thing, but somehow it never made it to us. And, uh, and we even went back through old meeting notes and recordings and, and we just had nothing on this. And, uh, and he said, but that's the secret sauce of this whole project. And I like that phrase because it was very secret. And uh, we, uh, you know, we, we recovered from that and, and gave him what he wanted, but of course, but you know, it's, it's, this is just an example of how this kind of thing happens. Um, other problems, plain English is sometimes inadequate when conveying technical info. info. Sometimes you got to use technical terms and you got to make sure you phrase things correctly. So the developer can work from that spec and not misunderstand anything. And, um, but then, you know, then you start leaving behind that person you want to read it, who's your client. Um, and, it should actually be more detailed and more verbose as far as the developer is concerned, but we have to constrain ourselves from that because you know, we're trying to make this thing work for two different people. I think you see where I'm going with this. And also another problem that we have is by not including the developer in the meetings from the beginning, um, we're, we're playing a game of telephone a little bit, right? If they're not there to hear everything that's said, sometimes you know the, the real goal maybe might be getting missed or, um, uh, you know, some of the, the most important information might just slip by somehow, you know, maybe we don't record it correctly or whatever. Um, so that creates a lot of extra churn too, because we're going back and going, no, no, you did this wrong. You need to change it this way or that way, or just, you know, whatever. You can imagine how the conversation level goes way up when you have to be a middleman for a project. And the estimates of the overhead portion were just kind of done by gut. You know, it was just not scientific in any way. And, uh, I wasn't happy with that either. I felt like we could do better. So we took a big step back and the first, this is the first time um, I've challenged this, like the core of this process um, in a very long time. And I was looking at solving two major problems, which were, you know, I wanted better communication with my clients at, at this initial stage of, you know, handing them their, their estimate and, and, and asking them to trust us to build their software for, can sometimes be a pretty good chunk of change. Um, and I wanted to build a better estimate that they would want to read. And 
I wanted to build a stronger process that others can follow so that um, uh, it's not just all about me running the requirements but um, or the discovery process, but, but having others involved too. I want to include the developer in the process earlier and I want to extract myself as that critical element. So um, I brought this new thinking to my team. This is Ozzy meeting with his team. Um, and uh, everyone agreed that it was time to update our process. Uh, so I dove in. And the first fundamental, most important thing to understand, the big fact that has been made very obvious, not only by what I'm saying, but what you all, you all already know, is that a client is not the same thing as a developer. The client desires a concise description of the system's capabilities. And they want to know that we're adhering to their processes and their rules. And we're uh, um, going to give them, a, you know, we're giving them an accurate cost. And we're giving them a time to delivery that they can live with. The developer needs details about what to build, the parameters and conventions they need to adhere to, the suggested methods um, that, that, we, that might need to be imparted to them when that's needed. Um, as well as a deep understanding of the processes and the rules that, that the client needs to follow. And they also need a timeline to work on. So um, we decided that um, we were going to create two branches of our discovery process as far as what our output looks like. One of them is the client facing information or what will be known henceforth as CFI. It's up here output is geared exclusively towards the client, but it has value for the developer too, because you know they can read it and get kind of a synopsis view of things. And then the next one is what's, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm one slide behind. Um, the next thing is uh, the developer facing information. So the developer um, needs a whole different set of information. They need, uh, um, you know, all that technical information that I was talking about before, only more in depth. So we decided to split the requirements into two parts, the CFI and the DFI. The CFI is business requirements. Um, that's synonymous with CFI. This is just the acronym I came up with and I ran with it. Um, but in a lot of places, it turns out these are called, technically these are called business requirements and the developer facing DFI is called technical requirements. And if you look at the diagram on the right, um, you'll notice that the developer facing information or DFI matches that methodology that I showed you earlier, the type, the module, the feature set, the requirement and the component, because that was working well enough for now. And we think that we're gonna replace this later on down the line with something more sophisticated that gives us more latitude to have more or fewer levels where right now you kind of have to fill in every level on this because of its very, very flat um, way of doing things. But um, for now, uh, we thought this would be a good middle ground to stick with that for the developer side of things. But one big change, and that is the overhead now gets a new record type. And each one of those pieces of overhead or all of its components gets a percentage assigned to it. This is the percentage of what the total project time and cost is. So you might assign 1% to configuring security and you might, you might assign 20% to project management overhead. Um, but anyway, it's gonna multiply all the hours for the actual development by that percentage and give us an overhead amount. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about that later. But um, on the other side, we have really just kind of a, we have a, a flat, database that allows us to have as many levels as we want with parents and children all within the same table. And uh, so we can go as deep or as shallow as we want on anything we write about. And it's mainly gonna have, each thing's gonna have a title, a description, a sort value of some kind and a cost. And um, that cost will be calculated by adding up all that linked DFI because um, in the middle you see that green box, that's the join table that joins together all that DFI with all that CFI. So um, what that's going to do is give us all those technical requirements tied directly to what the client is asking for, what they need. And um, there are a few um, 
a few little things about that. Um, first of all, um, well, actually, I just kind of covered everything in two slides in one, but um, yeah, I'm gonna skip this one because I already said all that. Uh, so just to kind of drive the point home, on the left, you can see what would be in the DFI and on the right, what would be in the CFI. So anything that's about how, how the system is gonna be built is going to be the stuff on the left and it's gonna be things like tables, field lists, screens, tabs, scripts, calculations, joins, anything that you wanna specify um, on the technical side. And then every one of those DFIs has to get linked to the CFI. There can't be any orphans because otherwise your costs aren't gonna be right. And sometimes though, we imagined that there could be circumstances where you might have kind of an all-purpose thing that can be used for more than one of your client-facing requirements. So in that case, what we decided was that um, we would have to deal with that on a mathematical basis. So if you have something that links to two different client-facing requirements, you have to split the cost in half and show that on each one in order to get it to add up right. And I know if we start dividing things into thirds, we're gonna get little rounding errors and stuff, but we, we figured that wouldn't be a big deal since we generally you know, round to the nearest dollar anyway. Um, and really, theoretically, not that we need to do this, but as a check, we can add it up on the DFI side and on the CFI side, and they should match once we've matched everything up. Those totals should be the same because uh, it's all coming from the same place. And that would be one way to make sure that we're doing it right. Um, the unit of measure for the CFI for what we show to the client, it's all going to be in dollars because that's what it needs to be in because they want to know what it's going to cost, right? Um, the unit of measure for the DFI side is an hour because the developer has to know how many hours we've estimated for this and try to stay within that. Um, I'm not going to go into this chart on the right because it comes up again later, or this, um, this box on the right, but um, the the DFI overhead, all that other stuff, um, the deployment stuff, et cetera, um, assign a percentage to each one of those items and add that up to get a total. So that's, so we've got two totals that add up to a whole, right? We've got all the development stuff and then we've got all the, all the overhead. And um, so then I started looking for people who've already done some of this, or at least done some of the thinking on this. I wanted to see if I was, way off base. I wanted to see if um, I was completely in new frontier territory. I didn't think I was, but you know, a lot of this was stuff that I just came up with out of necessity. So couldn't be sure. Um, so I did, I found insights into new thinking. I found others who had done some of the work for me and I found a lot of validation for my ideas. And that's just as valuable as finding new ways of doing things that other people have done that you haven't thought of, right? You know, knowing that your ideas are not you know, that you're not wandering in the wilderness, that's that's a good thing. And I got pretty excited, like Ozzy here. Um, I uh, really um, found a few things that I thought were very valuable. Um, I just found a lot of stuff that sort of repeated the same things over and over. There's a lot of plagiarism going out there about a lot of this stuff. Uh, a lot of people borrowing from each other's ideas, but um, I did find some things that were, were really quite, quite good. Um, so the first thing I found was this IEEE document. IEEE 29148, Systems and Software Engineering, Lifecycle Processes and Requirements Engineering. And you know, try not to uh, try not to memorize that. Um, it's, uh, it's a, a long, boring title for a long, boring document. But actually, there was stuff in there that I was able to get pretty excited about because it really gave me a lot of what I needed. Um, I use this mainly as a way to structure my CFI because um, I felt like I had a pretty good handle on writing technical stuff already. Um, although there were a few little tidbits in there, but mainly this, this told me how I should write client facing information. And um, here are some of the things that, that they mentioned that were, some of these were new to me. A lot of this was new to me and was really helpful. Um, terms to avoid in the language, uh, like superlatives, things that, that are subjective, um, things that are ambiguous, um, which sort of is the same as a subjective 
a little bit different. Um, and then there are terms you should use. Um, they're really big on using shall and will. Um, and by the way, this document is, you have to buy it from the IEEE. I found an, an old version that someone had put out on the web, but it was way out of date. Um, I could tell that it was out of date because there were certain things it didn't talk about enough, like, like agile methodologies, for example. And so I went there and I, and I bought this document. Um, and this is the 2018 version is the latest one. And it was over $100. I want to say about $120 for this. This is how, I guess, how the IEEE makes their money. It's by selling these documents. And, uh, um, or at least how they fund themselves. I think they're, they're a nonprofit organization. But um, anyway, um, it, uh, it, was worth, it was worth the money. Um, requirements construct. So a unique ID, what they mean by that is not how we think of a unique ID when we're developing, but um, just a catalog number for reference. So when you're having a conversation, you're sure that you're talking about exactly the same thing. Um, risk is a really big one for me um, because uh, I hadn't thought about that at all, but actually talking about what the risk is of the thing that you're undertaking, this, this part of the project that you're going to build, what is the risk of it failing? You know, um, sometimes you, you know that you're gonna build something really complex. And so it's gonna have a higher possibility of failure. Um, and, and also what is the risk if it does fail? What is the risk to the organization? These are things that um, sometimes need to be enumerated so that um, you can talk about them with the client. And sometimes by putting it in a document like this might be the time when they might really listen and say, okay, maybe we need to back off a little bit on that process and maybe we can simplify it. Let's talk about the process again. So I thought that was a really good thing to include in there. Um, the rationale, why are we including this in here? What problem does it solve? I think that's a really good thing for the client to know. And sometimes a, C a CEO, if you've been interviewing various people in his organization and he hasn't been there the whole time and now he's looking at this thing, he may need to see that rationale um, and understand why this is important to have in there. Um, the, uh, the difficulty, um, there's two ways you could look at that. One of them is you could just state, you know, this is going to be pretty difficult to build. It's going to cost more. But you also may want to um, have some kind of like a difficulty score, a factor that you apply. So you might say, normally to build a thing like this, it takes 10 hours. But this one's gonna be really difficult because of all these extra rules that we have to follow and, and all this extra, um, I don't know, permissions we have to put on things. So um, I'm gonna give it a higher difficulty score and that's going to change um, you know, the cost. Um, that would be a good way to, um, to help with the estimating process. Um, and categorization, you can categorize things however you want to. Um, I showed you how we categorize by module, client module, orders module, inventory module. Um, but you could also categorize by process, beginning to end, um, whatever works. Uh, just have some kind of categorization is the point. Um, the characteristics of requirements, they're necessary. They have an appropriate level of detail. And by appropriate level of detail, what they mean there, they talk about it at length, is, is don't go into too much detail about how it's going to work. Go into detail only about what it's going to accomplish and that how and what is gonna come up again. Um, and it needs to be unambiguous, meaning um, you know, there's no doubt about what you're saying about this thing. Um, complete is obvious and um, singular, meaning that you don't repeat yourself across multiple requirements. Uh, I think you have to be somewhat flexible on that because there's overlap sometimes. And sometimes you have to repeat a thing from two different perspectives in order for it to be fully understood. Um, next up is the, the language criteria. So this is really important. This, this phrase right here, what, not how, is the, the, uh, the gist of the whole thing. The what goes to the client. This is what the system is going to do. This is what you are going to be able to accomplish with this system. And the how is what the developer gets, right? The developer gets the, you're gonna build this, 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 and this all together. So um, I thought that was interesting. They actually phrased it exactly that way. 
Um, there are levels to the requirements. Um, if you're building, especially something like an ERP, some of the stuff you put in there might be all about the entire organization, something that affects the entire organization. And other things may affect only one person or one team for their unique process that they do. And so that's a good thing to delineate in your, in your requirements. Um, and then the last thing was, um, this actually came before, but I'm, uh, I'm only bringing it up here um, because I wanted to get over the other stuff first, but um, they actually want you to, to collect the business description, which could be the mission statement if they have one of the company. Um, having them write this up, I think is really valuable. Asking, I just, uh, for the very first time, asked a new client to write all of this up for me. And he did a brilliant job of it. And he said some stuff that um, he hadn't told me before. And he did it more succinctly. Um, the business description, um, the project mission and goals. You know, why are we building this software? What are we going to do with it? What problems is it going to solve? Um, who are the project stakeholders? Um, and uh, a system summary, which I think of as kind of an executive summary. So you might not write that until you've written all of your other requirements. And you might pick some pieces out of it to write a shorter um, summary, which may end up being the only thing that CEO reads, even, <laughs> even if you've got something much more brief than what I used to throw at them. <clears throat> so. Um, the next next resource I ran into was much, much, much shorter than the IEEE document. It's really only a few pages long, but it's really jam-packed with some good information. It's called Estimation Guidelines and Templates by Dawn Holmes at the University of Edinburgh. And I have no idea who this person is. I don't know if she's a professor, if she is a grad student, if this is someone's um, you know, paper that they wrote, if this is an internal document that they use. I kind of think it's the latter, but I don't know. Um, there's nothing to identify who Don Holmes is. But um, uh, there's a link to all of these, by the way, um, at the end of these slides. Um, she came up with this idea of three-point estimation, or at least she documented it. Um, and she likes the idea of, of putting in best case, most likely, and worst case hours for a, something that you're estimating. Um, so, you know, best case being, oh, you know, if everything goes as smoothly as possible and there's no hiccups, and we're not scratching our heads over anything, this is how long it'll take. Most likely, eh, we're probably gonna scratch our heads over a couple of things. So this is how long it's gonna take. And um, in the worst case, if everything just goes, just blows up and, and you know, you talk to the client a little bit more and they give you a bunch of information that you didn't have before, well, maybe this is where it's gonna end up. Um, and then she uses a weighted average and a standard deviation formula to get a more accurate number or range. And actually um, has a way to assign percentages of accuracy. Like this, this has a 95% chance of being accurate. This version has a 75% chance of being accurate. Um, so it's kind of interesting what she did. I don't know how good it really is, but I like the idea a lot. And I especially like the weighted average formula. Um, and it validates the concept of, uh, of overhead being calculated from a percentage. She talks about that too. And you guys saw this chart earlier. Now I'm going to dive into a little bit more deeply. These are her numbers. This is straight out of that document. Um, you know, she assigns 20 to 25 percent for project management, five percent for quality assurance, 20 percent for business analysis, and 25 percent for systems analysis. And I don't think these numbers are too far off. Um, she's thinking about things a little differently because she's not a filemaker developer or, or head of a filemaker development team. But um, at its core, I think she nailed things down pretty good here. Uh, and so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, that we were thinking alike in that respect. And uh, so um, I didn't really use this as a jumping off point, but it was nice to have a little validation again. Um, Bob, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, nowhere in any of this have I seen anything for either uh, client or developer documentation. Have we all come to agree this is not part of the project or... 
What kind of documentation are you talking about? I mean, a user manual for the users oh. or technical documentation for subsequent developers. So if that is, if that is part of your, uh, of what you do, I would, I would consider that to be part of the overhead. That would be one of the overhead items that you would have. Um, we don't write documentation generally because what I have found is that um, it takes a long time to write, sometimes as long as building the system and people don't read it, they call you instead. Um, you know, as far as user documentation goes, as far as documentation within the system, that's just something that's kind of part of estimating the time, I think. I mean, in my team, we're, we have a pretty strong requirement that you know, scripts and calculations need to be well commented so that it's clear what's going on in there. And then sometimes, you know, obviously all of this that we're collecting in terms of discovery information is part of that documentation too. So you know, if we had a new team come in to do work on it later on down the road or a new developer or whatever, then I think all that is there. Um, so we don't have a formalized process for doing that. Do you have do you have something more formalized in, in the way you do that? Um, when the user, when the customer asks for it, I estimate mm -hmm. another twenty to twenty five percent for uh, user manuals. Oh, you're able to write one in that amount of time. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, you have to have the system pretty uh, matured in order to get anything reasonable, because otherwise yeah. it's a moving target. Yeah. So, yeah. Good point. With waterfall or with agile, um, with agile development, it's always a moving target. So uh, we try to discourage the customer from asking for it. Yeah, yeah, we do too. And, um, generally, uh, generally when I say what I just said, which is it takes a long time to write, it's expensive and no one reads it. They just laugh and go, oh yeah, and they nod their heads. So <laughs> people get that. Um, yeah, okay. the, the, oh yeah, I, was, I don't know if I can speak, but the um, yeah, you know, we do the same thing. We let the user um, create their own if they want it, and they end up using the application in ways we didn't expect anyway. So, <laughs> another good point. Yeah, if I can, can I ask a question? This is Randy. Um, Randy. How do you, on complex systems where there's so much in it, let the the client and subsequent users of it know all the capabilities? Uh, you know, that's, that's hard. I, I, I prefer to do formal training with their teams um, and then count on them to kind of uh, do their own training beyond that internally. But, um, you know, sometimes people do forget the features are there and they do things the hard way. And then you, know, you find out about it later. I'm sure you've all had this experience. You find out about it later. It's, why are you doing it that way? You could just be clicking this button. You're like, oh, I never knew what that button did. So yeah, that is that is a problem. Um, and you have to kind of stay on top of it, I guess, and be there for your clients and know when that stuff is going on, which you can't always. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if we're doing that right or not. You know, it's a good question. Um, I like, like I said, I like to do formal training. A lot of times, even that doesn't really end up happening instead because we do kind of that modified agile approach that I told you about. Instead, we're really iterating a lot, like, you know, um, you know, getting a lot of versions out to the client on a fairly fast schedule and getting them working in it and having them get other people working in it. And there's sort of organic understanding falls into place as they watch it develop and grow into the, you know, into a finished system. And uh, that sometimes is the best training you can have. One thing that I have done um, to uh, uh, to kind of bridge that gap is if there's details that are really not obvious, um, for example, you know, if you hold an option key and click this, then you'll get some other uh, thing to happen. Um, I'll put a question mark uh, icon, you know, up in the upper right, and uh, it's basically a popover. And I'll just put very articulate, basic little things that will remind people if they uh, uh, of, of things that aren't obvious. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of a, it doesn't take too long to do. Uh, you do it while it's fresh in your mind. And uh, 
you know, it, it can help by instead of like a, a full manual or whatever. Yeah, we just did that for a scheduler screen. We have this like this drag and drop scheduler and, and it's got a lot of iconography in it in order to keep things, you know, not taking up too much room basically. And, um, and uh, the client requested this and it was a really good idea when they did. Uh, um, and same thing, little info button, a little popover comes up and it just tells you what all the different icons mean and, and you know, what different colorations or, or changes in the icons might mean. Um, and uh, they found it very valuable. So yeah, it's a good idea. Um, all right, uh, continuing on. Um, the third resource I ran into was not as useful, but it was instructive and interesting. And so I hung on to it. Um, it's, it's the chaos report from the Standish Group. Now the Standish Group is a, a for-profit, um, I think they're a workflow optimization kind of uh, consultancy, um, but they, they did analysis of more than 10,000 projects between 2011 and 2015. And um, projects that succeeded, which means on time, on budget, and with a satisfactory result, uh, came out at about 29%. These are software development projects. Now, not FileMaker software development projects, but just software development projects in general. Were challenged in some way, meaning they did not meet one of those three criteria. Once again, on time, on budget, or a satisfactory result. And uh, that was 52% of them were challenged. And 19% of them failed, meaning they just never made it all the way through to deployment and, and client acceptance. Um, and they compare Agile versus Waterfall. There's a lot of these kind of charts that you're seeing on the right here. Um, uh, they compared agile versus waterfall causes of success, large versus small projects, uh, large versus small companies and other factors. Um, it's, it's a little brief, but, um, it's, it's some interesting research and I, uh, definitely, um, uh, would recommend that you download and read this again, the links are all at the, all at the end of the, the slides. Um, and then uh, some challenges that we're facing with all of this. Um, it's requiring a rebuild of our internal systems. That's, that's a lot. Um, that's mostly done. That actually is kind of turning out to be the easy part. Um, and uh, you know, we found that you know, we've really had to formalize our internal systems a lot, formalize you know, all of our time tracking and, and everything about how we track bugs and so forth. And uh, we've got all our own internal systems for doing that. Uh, and uh, that's been really, really valuable. And so um, it's really important that, that our internal systems keep up with whatever changes we're making in the company. Um, everyone's going to have a learning curve with this. Um, not only do they have to learn to use the new, the new stuff that we just changed with our internal systems, which is not a big deal for them to do, but um, learning how to do discovery, learning how to be a part of the discovery process for um, developers, people on the team um, is, uh, you know, everybody does some of that already, but um, being, you know, like a primary part of that process is going to be new. Um, and it does create a potential need for some documentation of that process. How do you do this? How do you do this job of gathering requirements and, and doing discovery? And, and how do you cover all the bases? And what are the things you need to watch out for? Um, what are the right questions to ask and when, that sort of thing. Um, the results of this are not going to be accurate right out of the gate. Um, those percentages for, for the um, overhead, for example, um, going to be kind of doing a post-mortem on everything to see where we end up because um, they're probably going to be off. Some of them might be off by a lot. Um, but all in all, I think this is going to be a more accurate way of estimating than what we've been doing in the past. So here's where we are now. Like I said, the software back end, it's mostly built. A few little tweaks need to happen. The output is still being refined. Um, it's a fairly complicated report, set of reports. Um, and we haven't put it to the test yet. We've got some new projects pending, but they haven't quite landed yet. So we're gonna have to wait until they land and we do some discovery and, and uh, see how it works out. Um, this is Ozzy being put to the test here. He's herding some sheep. Uh, he actually, we take him every weekend to go herd sheep. Uh, he's a border collie, he's gotta herd sheep. It's just, otherwise they get a little crazy. Um, takeaways, 
Um, once again, a client is not the same thing as a developer. Um, and you have to you have to give your documentation to each of them in a different form. Overhead is its own problem to be solved. I'm not advocating for this methodology. These are just my observations and I'm just taking you along for a little bit of my journey. Um, you may not need this kind of formality or you may need more formality than this. Um, and uh, you know, you're gonna have to decide, um, but uh, this is just how we're doing it and I wanted to share it. Um, none of this is easy or should it be. Discovery is hard work by design. Um, we're tasked with encapsulating all these different attributes of an organization or a department within a larger organization. People, processes, rules, all the minutiae that go with them um, and having to decide you know, what's important or, or at least glean what's important and what's not important and what can wait, and what's, you know, what needs to happen now, where are the real pain points. Um, and uh, that's all hard. And having processes and systems in place for handling all of that, I think that promotes consistency and accuracy in the long run. Um, here are the links. These are the, the, the documents um, that I just outlined for you. Um, feel free to screen capture them or whatever. Um, and uh, sorry if you have to type that last one, it's kind of long, but um, that's about it. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then I would like to, uh, open things up for discussion. Actually, Bob, can you put um, those links back up for a second, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't leave them up long enough today. Uh, uh, and maybe, okay. maybe you could copy and paste them into the chat when you get a chance. I would be happy to, um, but there they are. Make them bigger. Ah, put my notes up on top of it. There you go. And I will open up into the chat. Um, okay, um, questions? I'm gonna stop sharing now. Comments, discussion? Russ had a question. I don't know if he's still here, Russ. Yeah, I apologize. Yep. I couldn't see your questions while, while I was presenting. So I, I'm sorry I didn't answer any chat stuff. Yeah, great stuff. Really interesting. Really appreciate it. Um, I Thanks, was just Russ. curious how you're planning on handling the the balance between an agile process where you don't yet know everything and a mechanism that's calculating everything down to the T based on what you're building. Well, yeah, it's that's that's one of the hard things about it. You know, I mean, I you know, in the early days when I first started building, I did a complete waterfall process because Agile didn't even exist yet, really. And, uh, um, you know, I would build things, you know, I'd build these complete modules, right? And I'd know that they weren't 100% done, but they were done, mostly done, right? And, and I didn't want to show people unfinished work. I didn't want to show them something that was still with the wires hanging out. And people would look at it and go, oh, my God, you spent all this time on this. And this is not what we want. And, you know, there would be some fundamental thing that I missed, you know, you know, way, way back in, in the discovery process or something I misunderstood or, or whatever, or something that was just a matter of open interpretation that, you know, wasn't that I got anything wrong. It was just that I saw things differently from the way they saw them. So I started putting things in front of people earlier, which follows a more agile kind of methodology in that, you know, I'm, I'm you know, giving them constant iterations of their system from pretty early stage. And I, I tell them that, I tell them, you know, this thing's going to be kind of messy looking and don't click that button. And, and there's going to be some buttons there that are only for the developer and ignore them and, you know, things like that. And, 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 uh, you know, I found that worked better, but, you know, there's, there's nothing you can do about scope creep except for deal with it. Right. You know, if you put things in front of people um, more often, you're going to get, more feedback that's going to include things that were never part of the original scope because when people see things they then go oh you know when they see what you've done they go oh by the way if they can do that it'd be great if we could also do this and so then you have to you know have uh you know change requests and, and that sort of thing um to to help deal with that scope creep um you know 
The problem with agile, with true agile, is that it's impossible to budget for it. And people don't want to dive into a software project where they have no idea where they're going to end up on cost. Um, they're just, you know, they're very skittish about that. So, um, uh, you know, that's why we don't do true agile with most of our clients, because most people don't have an open-ended budget. So, so yeah. just to follow, to follow up, that makes complete sense. So you're you're basically doing an, a sort of an approximate waterfall, sort of roughing out what you think is going to be there for the initial pricing, and then treating the agile mods as change orders or some other after that initial budget process. Or do you start off yeah. with just sort of very crude outlines in your on the um, developer facing stuff and then flesh it out as you go. No, we, we try to get as specific as we can on the developer facing stuff. Um, if we think we have a clear idea of what the, what the client's needs are, you know, um, uh, you know, this is, this is the, the big problem of estimating anything is software related, right? You know, we're all dealing with this one and, and it's, uh, you know, it's hard. Um, you know, you have to, you have to decide how much of what they throw at me in terms of, you know, differences, what they want done differently. Am I going to accommodate as part of the cost of doing business and how much of that am I going to charge them for, right? You have to look at those things and make those determinations. Um, you know, most of the time it's, you know, you know, they're asking you for things that you did not budget for. You did not write into their, into their estimate. So, you know, a lot of change requests might ensue for sure. Um, and that's something that we haven't formalized as much as we should have. We've sort of been like, well, you know, it's going to cost you more. Okay. And then, you know, kind of leave it on a handshake basis. And that hasn't worked out very well either. So, um, we're formalizing that as part of this too, actually. Thank you very much. Sure. Hey, Bob. Yeah. How, how far do you go in your initial analysis before you, um, or your initial estimates and so on before you sort of perform a go no go analysis in other words you have to do some of the planning and some of the scheduling and budgeting and then you have to decide whether the client can even afford to go forward with the project or whether the time frame is realistic um if i've had clients ask me for that um and i've given it to them then otherwise that's not something that we normally do might be a good idea though do you do that with with your projects well, typically, typically with uh, larger architectural projects, yeah, you have to do some sort of rough budgeting, rough scheduling, and so on. And then you may go back and meet with the client, and you give them a rough estimate and a rough schedule, and then and then you and then you talk to them and say, you know, we think your schedule is unrealistic, or you can't do it for the amount of money you think you've got to spend, and so on. And then you decide you've either got to change the schedule or the budget, or you have as a design firm have to decide not to do the project. Yeah, we get a lot of that at the beginning. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, one of the things I always try to do uh, as early as possible is, is ballpark the project as I see it without knowing very much. You know, and I always tell them, you know, it comes with a giant grain of salt because, you know, there's a lot we don't know. Um, and and time frame, nine times out of 10, the client wants it a lot quicker than it could possibly be delivered. So usually I have to adjust their thinking on that, but you know, I have, a, I have ways of phrasing things that helps them understand that. So, um, but not like midway through doing discovery generally, unless they specifically ask for that information. Hey, Bob, I'm no. sure I stepped out of the room and missed this, but you charge them for this discovery process process? And the concomitant documentation that you have to put together for it. Yes. I charge them my hourly rate. rate. Oh, it's an hourly rate? It's not like a flat fee to do the discovery. It's not, no, it's not a flat rate. It's an hourly rate. Mm -hmm. Because if I, if I did it flat, you know, yeah. I've had too many projects where the client really downplayed how much work needed to be done and how, and how involved the project is. So, you know, I could really lose my shirt doing something like that. Um, instead, I just give them, again, I ballpark what I think the discovery is going to take too. And I collect a deposit on that up front too. Can you give me an idea on the range of hours from the smallest to the largest uh, for the discovery process? Sense? Mm, 
Now, this is something I've always done with a percentage. So I, I generally just tell them it's going to be about 15 to 20% of what I estimated their total project might be when I gave them their ballpark for the project. Mm. That's great. Thank you. John, sure. one of the things I do when I'm selling the discovery process is point out that they're going to get documents that they own after discovery that they should be able to take to any developer or you know just have as an analysis of their current processes that there's not discovery isn't a zero product process they actually own something at the end and that helps me sell it a lot my estimate is about in line with bob's 15 to 20 percent of the total project we um i like one of the things that bob talked about the complexity you know, there are times when you're sitting with a customer, I mean, just in simple terms, here's a list report. Here's a list report with subsummary parts. Here's a cross tab report, right? So to sit there and go, you know, these are, when you can show that complexity or share that, you're actually educating the customer on future work with them where they can go, hey, we're gonna do another report. Oh, it's, this is gonna be more like that middle one with just some sub summaries and totals at the bottom. You go, okay, that should be about X number of hours. So you're, I like the fact that you're using that kind of language and letting the customer know some of the things you're asking for are right down the middle, some are on the high end of that component. And some of the things you're asking for are a simpler version. I think that's great. Um, I always tell customers too in the discovery phase, if it's really easy for you to describe what you want, it's really easy for us to build it. So if you say, I just need a really quick little system with first name, last name, city, state, zip, and you go, great, I can do that very quickly. If somebody says, well, I need to have, you know, shipping and billing addresses and every once in a while I need to fly, you know, then all of a sudden we're getting into a longer conversation. You have to expect there's more complexity with that. That just kind of helps prepare them for the discovery thing. And then one of the other things you talked about, Bob, you know, we, we do, um, we work with, like Barry was working with architects and they have a way that they do their projects. And if you're doing a software project with that industry, you can adapt a little bit to the way they kind of work. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's, I think if, you're, if your firm is a little bit flexible in how you can tinker around with either full agile or full waterfall or hybrids in between, I think, I do think that you know, one thing that, that we often do is we'll put together the proposal and here's everything that you're getting and the costs and so forth. There are times when we get to something we go, we don't know. A very classic example of that data migration. So we'll sit there and go, look, we're going to build your system and there's going to be some componentry of agileness. You know, we're going to have some play work with some of the fields that you may throw at us late in the game and so forth. We don't want to sit there and meticulously figure out the, you know, every single hour required to do the data migration, we might throw a number at you to go, hey, it may be 10 to 20 hours, but we're not gonna hold tight to that just because, we'll, we'll, we'll requote that at the end after we know what the two systems are, if you'd like, but that's too complex. There's, there's a little bit too much unknown in terms of how much data and how deep we're gonna parse and all that sort of stuff. So I think it's okay also, when you talk about risk, I think it's fine to go, we can absolutely do this and we can absolutely do that. And these are the numbers we're comfortable with. And this right here has got lots of question marks and we're gonna give you a rough estimate, but understand that could play up or down from there. Yeah, we, we actually do the same thing. Um, you know, data migration is, probably the biggest wild card type of item there is in there because you just never know how what their data is going to look like and how much cleaning it's going to need and who's going to have to do that if you're going to have to build some kind of interim database you know temporary database that's there just for massaging their data from point a to point c and uh uh so yeah that's that's a big one um you know training is is another one that's you know kind of hard and and client meetings you know i've had clients say you know yeah yeah you know we'll just we'll just meet for half an hour every two weeks and then instead you know they're calling you for an hour every other day you know so you know you have to you have to be able to um build for that but you know sometimes it's way off so again just treat it as a percentage and hope you're right maybe yeah. change that percentage if the client is very chatty you know? Yeah, and that's that's something, Bob, where 
if you get that sense and you go, let's just say, oh, we're going to charge, you know, 10% for client meetings or 20% or whatever that is. If there, again, there are times where I want the customer to have control over that component to a certain extent. And that's something we might say, we anticipate, you know, let's just say 10 to 20% of additional time for client meetings, uh, you know, but we're going to bill for those uh, as ad hoc, you know? So if, if I get, we don't generally do that, but there are times when we get a customer, we go, wow, there's four different directors, different departments, they all have different needs. Uh, they're not all showing up to the meetings at the same time. You know, that's a, a situation where we'll go, hey, the scope of work is A through Z, and we anticipate an additional X amount for project management or customer relations. Um, however, we're going to bill for that kind of hourly. And that gives them control. Number one, we're telling them we don't know enough, but it also gives them control to go, hey, we're going to get our ducks in a row and come to you organized. And therefore, these meetings will go much faster and, and, and more affordably. Bob, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Um, sure, Alan. You have mentioned complexity a number of times. We have a lot of complexity. Uh, on the developer side, you know, you could have multiple, we, we, we have multiple developers and we have a project manager and we can have a QA person. Do you take into account, I mean, you're just counting hours, but each one of them have different rates and different costs. And do you have like a certain idea of a markup or do you not take that, uh, the costs in your overhead into account based on different rates for different people playing different roles in the project? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't, I, I generally don't charge the client based on the number of people in the meeting from our side. An hour is an hour. You know, if, if I have to bring three people into the meeting, including myself, then they're getting charged and it's a one hour meeting, they're getting charged for one hour. I don't have different rates for different things that, that we do. We charge a single hourly rate. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter there. Um, and, uh, so, you know, I yeah, you, you, we we charge the same amount, but in terms of your own overhead costs, um, do you take that into account, or do you just not? You're not you're not doing job costing on each job to that extent, right, Bob? You're not bringing in labor rates and amount of time or any of that. No, not as much not as much as I probably should be, <laughs> um, but I mean, I do do some of that. It depends on the job, um, you know, and how big it is, um, but. Uh, yeah, you know, actually, the smaller jobs are the ones where, where I have to be more careful about the, the, the job costing. It's kind of funny, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not too concerned about that, I guess. Um, uh, you know, mainly it's, uh, it's a matter of keeping the work flowing, you know, uh, more than anything. So, all right. My other question is, you know, we can, you can do all the work and get a good project scope, whether it's agile or waterfall. But if a project like goes on for six months, sometimes a year or two, you're, you're way you're way departed from the original estimates. And then you get into a situation of how you are accounting for uh, the project. It's, it's very hard to keep these things from going out of control. But sometimes they, they hit a spot where you hit an issue and I don't find out about it till later that my developers uh, went several rounds or several iterations to get something right. And, you know, I didn't know about it till, you know, maybe they build me or I have to build the client. I find out, oh my God, you know, do you actually, it actually took 50 hours to do this when we estimated it to be 20. Do you, you know, do you have situations like that or how, if you do, how you deal with them? Yeah, things like that come up. I, uh... I really work with my developers to um, to uh, be communicative with me early and often. Um, so if they're running into a problem like, oh, this is starting to spin out of control. I've been down in a rabbit hole for two hours on this thing and I still don't have a solution. And, and uh, you know, then they should be letting me know because there's ways to deal with that. You know, you can, they can talk to other developers. They can talk to our to Mark, our director of development. You know, they can. They can, uh, you know, their solutions to whatever it is that they're they're stuck on, and uh, and then also if they if they don't tell me about it and they 
you know, just spun their gears for a while before they even realized they were doing it. <clears throat> you know, our timekeeping, our internal time tracking system that we use to bill our clients, then they're expected to put comments in there to tell me, you know, oh, I got stuck on something. Don't charge for two hours here or whatever. And, and I, I honor that pretty strongly. Uh, Do you go clients. through every, uh, all the, things that they put in the time tracking, do you go through each one before you bill the client to determine whether it's billable or not? Not everyone, no. No. It, it, I, I look at it more from a, a holistic standpoint. Um, uh, I, I look at it more from a, mainly I, I, when they do put comments on, on their time, it flags it in a way that I can go through and just see the flagged items, so. That's mostly what I deal with. And then sometimes, you know, after the fact, the client will be like, well, it seemed like this took an unusually long time. And I, I know this thing happened and that thing happened. And you know, then I have to go back and do a little bit of forensics, you know, to find out what they're talking about. But that doesn't come up too often. Okay, thanks. Sure. Anyone else? Okay. Well, good. Well, thanks everybody. Appreciate your attention. Um, let's see, we are now at the point where we can do our breakout rooms. So I'm sure everybody's ready for some conversation with your colleagues. I'm going to put the All right. So Lynn, uh, you have something okay. you wanted to share? I am dealing with something now. I don't know how many people uh, are in a situation to be concerned with this. I have a client who uses um, SendMail SMTP through their Gmail account. And Gmail is closing down the permissions for less trusted applications to access their SMTP protocol. So that means that, and I just started exploring this. It just came to me this week for my client. Oh, I can't send documents anymore from FileMaker. So uh, I've got in touch with some people and I will be putting into our list, our discussion list, um, the solutions that I do find uh, based on things that other people have talked to me because I haven't had time yet to really dig into it. That there are other, uh, there's an API for Gmail that you can use. Um, so I, I need to work out, but it's not just changing the settings on the SMTP. The send mail script does not work. There aren't enough permissions in there to access Gmail anymore. So I just thought hmm. people who have clients who are using this may need to, uh, I don't know. One thing I'm going to look at is there's another, is there another SMTP server we can use rather than Gmail that will still allow this lower level of authorization. So hey, you know, Lynn. Lynn, it's, it's funny you mentioned that I got bit by that as well this week, not for FileMaker, but for, um, I use carbon copy cloner for backups and I have it set to send me an email when the backup finishes for some backups. And all of a sudden those emails stopped coming through. And I had run into this a while ago when they first sort of tightened and I had to go in and change the settings on the Gmail account to make it less secure. But it sounds like they're closing that down now as well. Right. And, you know, when you think about it, I have that configured a bunch of places. So going and hunting all of those down is going to be sort of a project. In right. Itself. It's kind of a phased rollout on who they're shutting off at what point. Right. So if you haven't gotten it yet from a client or, or from one of your own setups, you may soon. Yeah, I mean, think about all the FileMaker servers that are sent to send error notifications, you know, probably using a Gmail account. And if, you know, those just stop sending, there could be, you know, messages about backups failing or about who knows what that nobody's seen. So it's potentially a big, a big deal. Tony, I see you put something in the- uh, Oh yeah, uh, thank, thank you. Um, let me, I think we addressed this. I'll tell you what we did and then maybe other people can kind of check to see if if so i think we fixed it but let me know if this doesn't sound like a fix so um i i heard the same thing i heard that as of june 1st that free starting with free rolling out with free gmail accounts they were going to make the smtp more secure 
So uh, I went to Google. I located a, a, a web page where um, I dropped that in the chat. And I set up what's called an app password. And essentially what it is is a you know, process that you go through. You know, it's all listed in the document. And then you uh, get a password that's been sort of vetted, if you will, by a one-time trip through a two-factor authentication process. In other words, you fill out the form, it sends you an email, an SMTP or a phone call, and you say, yep, that's me. And then it does generate a string. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's a password, but it's a password that's been vetted through the two-factor authentication process. We put that into the box, replacing the old password. And I believe that that, and it's called an app password, and I believe that that was successful. We rolled it out uh, at least one place, uh, and it has worked. Um, so I think it's actually, it's a little bit less scary than it seemed initially to me. But that said, I'm, I'm wondering what other people are doing or if um, maybe I'm missing something. Uh, but it's working so far, as far as I can tell. And you were okay. able to use the same account, just add the app yeah. password for it's it? Yeah, just, it's, it's what's called an app password. And it, it, it kind of makes sense, I think, because, you know, if you're a spammer, and I'm not saying anyone here is a spammer, by the way, but if you someone's not on the phone calls a spammer, you would be, um, you know, you'd want to just make up your own passwords and set up your own thing. And you could do it in an automated fashion and very efficiently set up account after account after account, right? If you, on the other hand, uh, are using a password that has been vetted by, you know, a connection to a telephone, like you've, you know, identified yourself as a real person and gone through a certain amount of effort, one-time setup, then that would be more secure. And I think that's what they've done so far. At first, I was, I was living in a little bit of fear that I'd have to move SMTP emails to, um, you know, the awesome APIs and whatnot, you know, which are awesome, but not necessarily something I want to do for every single server. Um, How long does that password last, Tony? Um, I, I, I Ever think it lasts one year. I think it, unlike uh, these uh, digital, these pesky digital certificates, uh, mm -hmm. I believe that it lasts um, until the universe ends. I guess. No, until you uh, reset uh, your Gmail password. If your if your Google account password changes, then your app password is wiped out. Ah. Uh, um. So you now, Tony. You oh, have, but you have control over it then. Yes. Ah, nice. You have to have each client generate their own app passwords because you don't have access to their phones or whatever devices yeah. that you use to um, to register it, right? Yeah, I, I, Lynn, I think that's correct. You would want uh, individual clients to have individual passwords. I do believe that once a client, you know, because I don't want to know my client's passwords, well, sometimes I do, but you know, you don't want to have client A using the same as client B. Absolutely true. Uh, what I would say that, you know, if I do a, if someone uh, does an app password, I believe that you could use it across your devices. Mm. Uh, like in other words, you could use it if I'm using a Gmail account in, in multiple places, maybe for sending server SMTP emails or sending SMTP emails from the application and also maybe from just Gmail. I think I can use the same app password um, for, you know, for all my internal needs and whatnot. Well, great that this client has outgoing needs only and they use this one central um, account and then everybody has their own individual accounts for their other business. So um, that might work. Yeah, um, not as it's, uh, it worked here. And, um, and you the other thing, Anna, the other settings. It's fun. No, no, it was, it was, it was, you know, like I said, I was like, oh no, not another thing to deal with. Right. That was my initial thought. Like, uh, like I need more headaches. Right. Um, but it was like five to 10 minutes. Great. Well, thank um, you. But you know, your mileage may vary, but we did it. Um, I also, I have a paid and a free account in Gmail mm -hmm. and um, my free account still works. So I'm, not, I wouldn't, you know, be complacent, but I believe that the June 1st deadline might have been more of a threat. In other words, you like, they don't really want to break everyone's things, but you know how you like, oh, we're going to shut it off by June 1st. And then, you know, maybe they don't shut it off immediately. I don't know. Um, because I didn't change my app password. Um, on, on, I changed it in one spot, but not the other. And, and I sent an email from that today. So but eventually, yeah, and I think they're going to come after the paid accounts at some point. So 
but like I say, five to 10 minutes, no big deal. Okay, thank you very much. That sounds great. I just sent a link in the chat because I had looked this up a few years ago um, on how to maybe send more securely through Gmail. So I thought there was a solution on how to, uh, to, to do that, but that's different because this, you know, they hadn't turned the send less secure uh, method off yet, but this might have some more information that could be helpful. Another thing that okay. uh, is related that we've had to deal with this week, you know, we have our email based at triple eight and uh, I don't know, they didn't set up our, it's called DKIM, D-K-I-M records and the spoof SP, SFP to prevent spoofing that Google recommends that you have certain things on your email domain that you have to comply with that you set up to prevent people like we've got spoofed on one of our accounts and you know it's one you know, I just get everyday mail delivery you know I've changed the password on the account but it's all these things to prevent spoofing and uh, Gmail keeps rejecting certain emails, so they recommended that you go in and you uh, validate uh, the DKIM. I, I don't know if exactly uh, it's an anti-spam meaning of that, but uh, that's what Google was recommending to do. Yeah, there are a bunch of anti-spam measures. Running a mail server these days is is no fun, and there are all sorts of hoops that you have to jump through to get the big the big companies to accept your email. DKIM is one of those. Hmm. Um, wow. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, Dave, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, I've got a couple of news items. I just want to, you know, I, I think everybody knows that Claris Engage, you know, Nashville is not happening. Um, in light of that, Saliant and Proof Guys have a new little conference that they're playing with. Uh, they're launching this year on July 19th and 20th, uh, 8 a.m. on the 19th, all the way through to 4 p.m. on the 20th. I don't think contiguous. I think they're going to stop in the evening, but uh, it's called Auto Enter Live. It's free. They're currently looking for speakers um, to do 25 minute recorded sessions. Uh, I think they're going to do the recording, have the speaker present to do Q&A afterwards. They've got some vendor opportunities and booth opportunities and some other stuff. But anyway, they're planning on this for middle of July. Um, go look up. You can basically just go look up Auto Enter Live uh, or Saliant and Proof Guys. You should be able to find it. Um, other news item. Um, Problem Solver Circle. I think we heard from Andy a couple of meetings ago. You know, we're pushing this, this initiative. Um, they've got 500 slots. I don't know uh, about any of you, but they're they're being quite, uh, they're knocking on our doors a lot. Hey, do you have more customers and so forth? So they, I don't think they've gotten close to filling up those 500 slots with people interested, but we have seen them grab people with 10 or 15 seats and going, we're going to convert you to a 20, 25 seat site license. So even people who wouldn't normally convert to a, or be eligible for a site license, we're seeing some of that. Uh, just for you guys to know, if you got a customer that wants to lower their bill, site licenses generally, I don't know where the break even is on a volume license, but it's pretty affordable. Um, so anyway, um, another note, um, just to remind everybody about our, our buddies over at Dig FM, they were running their show there. They had one of their fight club meetings last night. They've also been doing a good collection of videos online, uh, some pretty good uh so some pretty good reviews of MongoDB and some other topics that are pertinent. So notwithstanding what we do here, um, just remember that they're up there as well. Um, and then one little bit of news just for Angel City. I just want to kind of announce uh, that because I think a lot of you guys might know some of the, the people I'm talking about here or the person I'm talking about. Angel City is proud uh, to announce that we just recently hired a former FileMaker business account manager, Glenn Suarez. Uh, he's joining our team as a client relations associate. Uh, we're super excited to have him back in the FileMaker community, and I'll probably have him pop by one of our future meetings just to say hi to that, uh, everybody here that who remembers him and so forth. So, and that's that's all I have. Awesome, thanks, Dave. Yeah, I just posted the link to the Auto Winter Live registration. Nice, thanks, Bev. Oh, great, thanks. All right, awesome. Um, well, 
let's uh, let's get started with our next. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob oh, yeah. I, see, I see Barry has his hand up, and I have yeah. a quick. Oh, I'm sorry. Well. That's all right. Right. I just want to make a quick announcement. I'm the shepherd for the next FM Disc meeting, and I'm looking for content. So if anybody has any ideas or would like to present or whatever, I'm going to put my contact information in the chat. Please um, send me an email. Tell me what your thoughts are. Um, we'll work something out, or or give me some references to some other content elsewhere if it's not for yourself um, so we can uh, put some good content together for the next meeting that's it all right and bob the thanks thing I to share just real quick was um this week was uh apple worldwide developer conference which is obviously you know specific to mac and ios and all of that but uh, there was one thing that was really sort of generally um i think interesting which is this new move away from passwords so there's this consortium called the FIDO Alliance. I'm not sure what it stands for, but it includes Apple, Google, Microsoft. So obviously the big, biggest players in terms of operating systems. And the goal is to make passwords obsolete. And so the idea is that in the future, when you sign up for a service, you'll authenticate with your device using biometrics, whether it's a fingerprint or a face scan or whatever. And that will effectively use this public private key encryption that will effectively become your way of authenticating in the future. So there will need be no password that you that could be stored on a server and hacked. There could be no more phishing attempts because there's no place for you to enter a password into a you know bogus site, et cetera. And you know over the long term, if it works, um, and they certainly have a lot of momentum behind it. It really could change how people authenticate to all sorts of services, which eventually could of course impact us as biomic developers. So it's just something to sort of be aware of. You're gonna start seeing probably, I'm pretty sure in the next version of the Mac and iPhone and iOS, um, or iOS and iPad OS operating systems. And I assume that Microsoft and uh, Google are gonna be rolling it into Windows and um, Android. Um, so anyhow, it's one of those things that could be over the long term, a real, a real shift and how we deal with um, security, authentication, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, Barry, yeah. uh, contact Stephen Blackwell. He he goes to the FIDO conferences every year. Right. And he may have some insights for us. Okay. Uh, just, uh, there's a, uh, a podcast called Security Now, and they addressed this whole FIDO issue in the last podcast, uh, which I believe was released on Tuesday. Excellent. Awesome. All right. Um, okay, Alexis has been waiting very patiently. We've had an unusual number of announcements, good, really good announcements, so not faulting any of that, but uh, you ready to go? Uh, you're muted. Yep, I'm ready, sorry, other than being unmuted. Uh, how long do I have for this? Because uh, if, if, I have 60 minutes of content, so uh, do you need me to, trim it down a little bit? Uh, no, you shouldn't have to trim your stuff down. Um, you've got uh, an hour and maybe 10 minutes for discussion. Is that enough? Sure. OK, all right. Then People can always let's contact me after. If you have a burning question that I didn't get to, just uh, feel free to reach out uh, at some point and ask directly. And OK. Brother, we could just mute themselves, please. Yes, please. And, uh, and Alexis is. Uh, uh, of course, the uh, founder of FM Design University. And if you've never gone there, you should check it out. I'm sure she'll tell you about it as part of her presentation. Oh, well. All right, take it away. All right, so are you able to see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, this is called Start With Design, How to Create Amazing UX Without Tearing Your Hair Out. So uh, thanks, by the way, to everybody for showing up. That's really awesome. It's always a pleasure to be able to uh, chat with a group directly. So if you don't know me, my name is Alexis, and I'm a FileMaker developer. I've got over 25 years now, ouch, of experience. I started using FileMaker actually in version 2 for a short time before version 3 came out. But uh, when I started developing, it was really in version three. And I became obsessed with design when I was taking a desktop publishing course uh, at that time. And when I started to develop solutions, I could see that the way an interface was designed really did make a difference to how easy it was to use and therefore how effective the solution would be. So I've been honing my UI skills ever since then. 
I realize that design can be difficult to learn for some people. And uh, so now what I part of what I do is help other developers improve their design skills. And I'm passionate about UI and UX because I really believe just like when I started years ago, that good design has the potential to really unlock the value of the FileMaker platform. So uh, before we get started, here's just a little bit uh, about me. I live in Toronto, Ontario, and I have a music performance degree in cello from the University of Toronto way back when. Uh, I also sew, knit, and crochet as much as I can. Although, you know, this blanket that I'm showing here, you here took me three years to knit. So I'm, you know, not as, uh, not as um, fast, I guess, as, as I would like to be perhaps. Um, and uh, I also spend time in my garden, uh, which is what, something I love to do. I've delivered several presentations on UI UX design at the uh, Claris Engage Filmmaker Developers Conference, as it was now before, known before. This is DEF CON 2015. This is my very first speaking uh, ever in Las Vegas. And this is 2017 in Phoenix. And I spoke in Bologna, Italy in 2018. And I do hope to be going back uh, to Italy in October. So here are some examples of my FileMaker design work. So as you can see, there's lots of different ways that you can create a solution in FileMaker. And what's common to all of these is really a focus on user workflows. So I designed all of these solutions using the process that I'm gonna show you today. So I sometimes hear from uh, people, you know, I don't really need design, you know, I don't wanna bother with it. And here's some of the most common excuses that I've heard. So design isn't that important. So, you know, just don't care about it or people are not gonna care about it. The project doesn't need design or the users are not gonna appreciate it. So it's not worth the effort. This one was particularly, you know, paining to me <laughs> as I'm, I'm so user focused. Uh, and design will take extra time and the client just won't pay for that. So I just wanna say that I don't accept any of these excuses. I, of course, am a really design advocate and here's the reason why. The alternative to good design is bad design. There is no such thing as no design. So every time you put something on the screen, you're designing whether you realize it or not. And so to be most effective, it's worth it to put those things there with intention. So you should always design. And it's because design really is that important. It can be the difference between an app that users love and one that ends up not getting adopted. We were talking about some of them today, despite all that work you put in. So users nowadays are exposed to a lot of software. And I hate to tell you this, but most of it isn't yours or mine. <laughs> so on average, people's expectations are a lot higher than they once were. Every project you create needs to be designed. So the question is, are you gonna go about it intentionally, making sure that the user has everything they need, or are you gonna do it haphazardly and just kind of throwing stuff on the layout and hoping for the best? So what you create doesn't have to be the most aesthetic solution out there, but it does need to meet users' needs. So they deserve to work with tools that meet their needs. And you know, how would you feel if you were asked to use frustrating, badly designed software because the creator didn't think that you would appreciate something better and more usable? So that's pretty, pretty crappy, actually. <laughs> So when you start with design, you actually head off a lot of the problems before the development begins. So you can limit the scope creep, for example. Uh, you can avoid some of those nasty surprises midway through the project. You can reduce the amount of rework required once the project's underway. So this makes your development much more efficient. And that means the design actually will not cost extra money. In fact, you could save money as a result of doing this planning upfront. Another bonus is that doing the design can help you manage some of the most common tough user problems. Like I've got so much data uh, and where do I put it all? Or I have different user groups uh, that are competing for screen real estate. Or partway through development, the user suddenly remembers something really important that they forgot to tell you about before. So this happens to me during the design process all the time, and I'm really happy to hear about it then and not later. So if you start with design, you're much more likely to explore all the relevant aspects of the project before you actually write a single script. Okay, so if you're like some of the students I teach in, uh, I have a course called the Workflow Design Workshop, you might have encountered some of these roadblocks. So you have no idea where to start. 
So it, at the beginning, it can be really hard to figure out, you know, where do I start? It's just kind of a heap or a mess of information and you need to know what to do first and that can be challenging. And it's true that there are a lot of different design principles then, you know, learning them all can feel tricky, but uh, it really is learnable and it does take practice to learn how to use them to their best advantage, but you don't need to be a trained artist to create something that looks good. There are also so many possibilities. There's so many possible directions. There's no one definitive right answer for any client problem. There's a range. And so if you're anything like me, sometimes you can get stuck in paralysis by analysis. Or you could just get scared away because the idea of relearning how to develop solutions after all these years can be intimidating. Well, there's good news. That's why I'm here. I don't want you to tear your hair out. So imagine instead if you actually enjoyed the process of designing a new solution instead of dreading it, and you could finally know exactly what to do and in what order instead of wondering where to start. And you could really look forward to doing the design portion of your FileMaker projects. And you could have all of the above with a reliable, repeatable process that you can apply to every new project and that will make everyone happy. So at one time I had many of these same problems. So uh, today I consistently deliver value for my clients through the power of design, but it hasn't always been that way. So a few years ago, just before I created uh, workflow-based design, I wanted to create a well-designed, useful, and of course, beautiful application for my client. But I really felt overwhelmed just thinking about like, where do I put everything? Because there's just so much data to manage and so little screen space. So not to mention uh, the user groups that all have different competing needs. So normally what I would do is I would ask the client to tell me, you know, what data do you want to track and what features do you need? And then I would go back and I would create a list and a form view of every table. And then I would try to figure out uh, how do I fit everything on the screen? And of course, there's always more stuff than there is space. So if you can relate to this, let me know in the comments if you've experienced this. I think you probably all have at some point at least. So this time, instead of focusing on the data being collected, I focused on the process that the user needed to follow to do their job. So what happened was this. Instead of providing generic tools for searching and sorting and data entry, I provided specific tools to help them focus on the information that they needed along each step of their process. And instead of building an interface that anyone and everyone in the company could use, I built it for just one user group doing one job function. And instead of allowing users to just enter any field and start typing, I made them edit in a card window where there could be better control, a centralized place for validation of the data, but also better support and explanation for data entry. We were talking earlier about what happens when you know, people forget the rules. You can do that in a card window and provide more explanation uh, for those kinds of instructions. So in the end, the client really loved it and workflow design was born. So I presented my ideas uh, in a talk at the FileMaker conference in 2019. And the response since then has been really phenomenal. And I've been using and honing this process ever since. And then I started uh, to teach it in a course that I uh, created called the Workflow Design Workshop. So I discovered that there's one thing in designing a software solution that matters above everything else. And it has very little to do with cool colors or hot new features or extended capabilities of FileMaker. I don't know if you can guess what's so important that it can make or break your app, but it is usability. So this is the most important part of your app in the end, because if it is not usable, then naturally users are not gonna wanna use it. So this harms the users, but it also harms you and your business. Developers I find often will get hung up on the aesthetics, but if you focus on usability, then a lot of the time the aesthetics will fall into place. So I'm gonna talk about usability in more detail a bit later in this presentation, but for now, I just wanna emphasize that usability really is not about the looks. So here's a quote to illustrate the point. Usability is about people and how they understand and use things, not about technology. What I realized and what I want to help you realize is that, like Steve Krug says here, 
Usability is not about the technology, it's about the people and the processes. So if you come away with one idea today, let it be that design is about creating usable software. So if you want to create amazing UX, then try not to focus on, on the aesthetics. Focus on the user, really understand them, their processes and their goals, and the visual design is secondary to that. All right. So I achieved success uh, by following a process that puts design before everything else. In other words, start with design. And this is something that you can do too. And today I'm gonna walk through a real world case study of a redesign that I did for a client from their original screens through low fidelity mockups, high fidelity mockups, and then to the final product. So you can see how starting with design maximizes your efficiency and increases the quality of your work. So if you want to create amazing UX without tearing your hair out, what do you do? Well, you need a process and one that starts with design. So allow me to introduce the five-step workflow design framework. So I don't want you to be scared of design. This framework is a repeatable process you can use for any design project, big or small. And it's the same process that I use for my projects. So you follow the five steps of the workflow design framework, and they are de define, research, visualize, build, and test. So uh, my workflow design workshop covers the first three steps because most people are pretty good with the build and test part. But um, these define, research, and visualize are the steps that are often missing for people who don't do the design first. Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly about each of these steps, and then I will show you the case study. So step one is define. So before you can build anything, you need to define it. And that sounds easy, but I think as Bob's presentation before kind of pointed out, it is some, somewhat a little bit difficult. So there's a process that I've developed. Uh, and, and even if you have your own process, you do you should probably develop, sorry, find a process that you, works for you to define, your, make sure you're defining your project correctly. So uh, clients come to us to solve their problems, but we need to make sure we're actually solving the right problems and that can be harder than it seems. So the problem they think they have sometimes is not their real problem. It can be the symptom of some deeper underlying problem or what I find sometimes they'll do is come to you with a solution uh, already and the problem is sort of wrapped up in that solution already. So you don't know, is that really the right solution or is it the right solution to the right problem? You'll only know that by actually defining the initial problem. So once you've defined the problem and you have an idea of what you're gonna be building, you can start to think about what would the structure be? So this is really about how would the information be categorized? What will the visual hierarchy be? And you need to do some research in order to answer these questions. So you're speaking with users and finding out from them, you know, what are they doing? What is their domain? All of those uh, sorts of interviews and questions. So uh, speaking of users, you also need to know who are you building this for? Who are their users? What are their roles? Uh, what is their working environment like? What business processes are they responsible for? What are their pain points? And also what workflows do they need? So at this point, you're gonna wanna start writing user stories and I'll talk about them uh, during the case study. So this now, uh, these steps, this builds up a reference for yourself of what needs to be built and why. So similar to the documentation that Bob was talking about before, you're gonna to start to have a real library of artifacts. And uh, I think someone else mentioned, you can share these with the client. This is a deliverable, they're paying for this and you can give it to them and they can take it anywhere they want. Uh, so they feel more secure about investing in this work because they're gonna have something really tangible at the end. So all of this is before you even Open FileMaker. So this is just completely independent of the technology that you use. You're really asking questions and you're document, documenting and the tech itself at this point doesn't matter. But what does matter is that you are uh, analyzing everything from the point of the user. So these documents you're creating, you're going to uh, refer to them when you start doing your visual design. And having these things documented does reduce the chance that you're gonna either forget to include something or you're gonna encounter, encounter a nasty surprise later on. So at step three, visualize. You can finally start putting some ideas down on paper. And if you want to, you can use actual paper, an actual pen or marker, uh, but you can also use um, your drawing software as well. 
so at this point, you're going to have a good understanding of what needs to be done and you've worked out the steps that you needed to do it. So now you're going to be creating some tentative designs and just trying out different solutions to the problems that you identified earlier. They don't really have to be all that accurate. They just have to be representative of the stories uh, of, that you identify to make sure that all of the user stories are represented somewhere. But in terms of visual looking a lot like what it's gonna be, you're just really trying to get something down and create a framework. Uh, so you actually don't need to reinvent the wheel. So a lot of software problems already have standardized solutions, and these are known as design patterns. So these can help you design faster because you don't need to waste time working out the proper steps. It's already done for you. And of course, you need to know about visual design principles because you want it to look nice. And you know, if you can follow the visual design principles, it makes everything better. And also make sure you keep it simple if you're not really uh, used to following visual design principles. And lastly, you need to take into consideration how people perceive and behave and how that affects usability. So, um, you know, we talked about how important usability is. So that's also an important part of the visualizing process. So this visualize step is really about taking everything you know so far and synthesizing it into a cohesive whole. So when you define your problem and you do your research first, it becomes a lot easier to come up with a design that works. And some things are just going to slot into place. Maybe you've used design patterns and they already suggest an interface that comes with them. So you're not going to have to rack your brain wondering what to put on the screen. Uh, where do I start? What do I do? So once you have your design, you can start building it. And this is where you can finally start cracking open FileMaker and creating some layouts. So this is where I used to start. I used to start just right in FileMaker. Uh, and being a crafter, you know, when I knit, they always tell you, you know, make a gauge swatch. If you're making, say, a sweater and it has to fit a certain size, you know, you want to do a little swatch uh, beforehand, before you actually start your sweater and make sure that, you know, that is the right size. And a lot of times, especially when I was younger, I would just kind of skip that, like, who cares who needs it? And then, of course, you, you know, spend a lot of effort building your or, you know, knitting your sweater and it's the wrong size. So this is sort of the equivalent of that was we kind of just dive right in and we don't have any uh, enough or maybe we do have some uh, research. But we don't necessarily have enough research to start actually going right to FileMaker. And of, also when we do it in FileMaker, it kind of looks finished. And so it, it's hard, sometimes harder to convey to the client that, hey, this is just an idea. These are just options. You know, this isn't a finished solution. So I like to use wireframing programs and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So when you get to the building part, this should be, you know, pretty easy because you're going to have a roadmap uh, that you've created for yourself through these uh, user stories, and you don't have to build everything at once, or you're going to start somewhere and then uh, go from there. So last but not least, don't forget to test. So I think we probably don't do enough, especially user testing. We probably do lots of unit testing where we're making sure there's no bugs and stuff, but we also want to test with the users and make sure that we are validating our assumptions because thinking about something or about doing something is not the same as actually doing something. So if you've ever had to use your own solution to you know, power through a stack of papers, you'll know what I mean, right? It's very different being on the user side. And users are only human. You know, We have to respect them and whatever abilities they, they have or whatever responsibilities they have in their, in their lives as well. And uh, sometimes they're just very busy uh, people. And so they want to interact with software you know, very minimally or whatever the case may be. But they're also notorious for forgetting important details so you don't want your hard work to go to waste uh, by building something and then just pushing it out. You want to be able to test and test and test and also test early as well so that you can head off problems before they become bigger issues. So the more you test with real users, the better your solution will be. So do not wait to the very end of development to get them involved. Involve them early, keep them in the loop. I'm really a big fan of as much transparency as possible, you know, uh, share share everything with them, have discussions with them. That also helps the later adoption where they feel like they were a part of the process and they're not just being given, uh, you know, something by their company and they're just told to use it. So listen to the feedback and no, don't take things personally, um, you know, make improvements. I know that we put our heart and soul into what we do and it's really hard for the user to say, I don't like that. 
you know, just flatly and like they just reject the thing that you built for them. Uh, but really just try to hear them, try to listen, like what is the problem? You know, write down their suggestions. You don't have to take all their suggestions. Sometimes users are just kind of grumpy or ornery or you don't know what's going on, right? Um, they may not be fully bought into the process, whatever it is. Just try to receive the feedback, take it as feedback, uh, and then think about what would make sense and just it's an opportunity to understand their situation better than you did before. Okay, so there you have it, this the five uh, step workflow design framework. So I wanted to just give you that overview of what the process is like. So um, we know uh, what to do, but how do we do it? And also without tearing our hair out. So you wanna create an amazing user experience that your clients are going to rave about. You know the design's important, but maybe you have no idea where to start. Maybe you started creating layouts, but you're maybe overwhelmed by all the possibilities and options. You could have started reading about UI and UX, but uh, you know, you're overwhelmed with that idea of learning a new, a completely new way to design. And you wish there was an easy way to design without all the trial and error. So that's what I teach inside the workflow design workshop. So today I'm gonna to go through the process with you uh, and I'll go through the curriculum week by week, but I'm gonna show you a real world project and use that as my case study. So you can see how I apply these concepts in real life. Okay, so I wanna tell you about the solution uh, I'm gonna use during this case study. So here it is. Uh, this was an existing solution that the client wanted to overhaul. And the business is a magazine publisher, and they publish uh, paper and you know print magazines, but also online uh, content as well. And uh, like most magazines, their main source of revenue is from advertising. And it doesn't look too bad visually. It's not the worst solution I've ever seen, but it leaves a lot to be desired from a usability and workflow perspective. And that was from them. That was their feedback to me. That was the reason they wanted to uh, redesign. It was a lot of clicking and different screens, and it was hard to create the things that they wanted. So that's the setup. So. First of all, why workflow-based design? So you can level up your UX by structuring your app around the user workflows instead of around backend data tables like we so commonly do. So we ta already talked about how usability is about people and how they understand and use things and not about the technology. So that's why workflow-based design encourages you to first define what the purpose of the project is, who the users are, why they want you to build this solution. So I think this is very similar to what Bob said in his previous example or his previous presentation. So when you're finished with this process, you'll have determined the uh, scope of your project before you've actually spent time actually building something that may or may not fit the user's goals. So here's the project objective that I defined for this. It's quite straightforward. There's nothing really uh, earth shattering about this. It's to manage the CRM and sales data for this business, uh, just describing what they do and uh, roughly how they do it. So one thing I like to do as well is sometimes you'll have discussions and things will come up. I also like to uh, actually sometimes define what I won't be building. So they may have mentioned, you know, a QuickBooks integration in passing or, or whatever it is, but you sometimes, I find it helpful to say it's, this does not include that. So it's clearer and there's not kind of, you know, an assumption made on each part, you that you're not going to include it and they that you are going to include it. So I like to do this uh, depending on the situation. You also want to define who are their users, what are their roles, especially. Um, uh, so you this way you're going to need to know, you're going to uh, know which groups you need to speak to and which ones you need to talk to when you're actually doing your research. So for this app, it was quite small. It was only one main user group and that was the salesperson. And here's an important part, you wanna define the why. So it's gonna be a short description of the purpose of the app and a general reason for it. So 
I mean, the client could go and, you know, buy any CRM off the shop. They could use Salesforce in theory, right? But they decided to invest in custom software. So why was that? What was the reason, right? In this case, for this client, they uh, found that what was available to them did not follow the process in the way in which they wanted to do it. And they also wanted to be able to integrate both their sales side and their production side relatively seamlessly. So if they could do everything in one program, that was a big benefit to them. So another benefit of this kind of work is that you have a chance to demonstrate to your client that you understand their problems. And you can also use this to check, are you both on the same page? They're going to help you write this, right? You're going to come to something that is an agreement between the two of you. So that way you are feel like you have agreement uh, moving forward and it can cut down on misunderstandings. So next we want to define what specific problems does this app need to solve? So this is where sometimes we can fall back into our old familiar solutions of things that we've done before, problems we've solved in the past. We maybe look at the client's business and say, oh, this is similar to that other thing. I'm just gonna do what I did before. But I really encourage you to dig deeper and also not just accept what the client tells us they want. Uh, you know, you need to find out from them what problems are they trying to solve and stay away from them sort of dictating to you what those solutions should be. You're really trying to get them to take a step back and, uh, you know, go away from their existing solution for a moment and just think about it from a conceptual point of view. What are their goals? Okay. So we also want to develop our own creativity, you know, when we're determining what the problems are, we need to think of outside our own boxes. So if we've been thinking a certain way for a long time, we really want to just drop all of our assumptions and really give some blue sky thinking. I have some exercises in uh, week two that help you do that. But you just the concept really is to just take a step back, you know, uh, stop judging uh, and just be collecting information. And you want to write some problem statements. So the result of this step is to actually write problem statements that capture what the heart is of the real problem, because those are going to offer the most value to your client and to their users. So these are going to statements that describe specific issues that they need to solve. So this gets you away from just writing lists of features. It's going to do this, it's going to do that, it's going to do whatever, right? And you're really starting to think about the overarching purpose of the app. So I like to write these as how can we statements. So you think about how can we, and then you fill in, you know, what is it that we want to change? So in this case, how can we allow a salesperson to quickly create proposals so they can close sales more quickly and with less effort? And another one is how can we uh, allow a salesperson to more easily stay on top of their to-dos? So ensuring that they follow up with their prospects regularly. So these are two pain points, two things that this client is struggling with today in their existing system. So these also help you lay down success criteria. So how do you know when you're done? You're done when these are, uh, are achieved, right? When they can create the proposals quickly and, and they're closing sales more faster than they were before, they're staying on top of their to-dos better, then the project is a success. So let's move on to the structure of your app. So when I talk about structure, I'm not talking about the schema. Uh, or the ERD or the data architecture tables and fields. No, I'm talking about the information architecture because users care about information, not about data. So there are any number of ways that you could organize your app and these are independent of the data structure. And this is called the information architecture and it's called IA for short and it's integral to a good user experience. In order to create a good information architecture, you need to do research about the people and processes so you can come up with a clear framework for how the app is going to be organized and including developing a hierarchy. So if IA is new to you, uh, restaurant menus, for example, are a form of information architecture. So the offerings are grouped into categories and they make sense to the customers. So in the context that they're sitting down in a restaurant and wanting to order food. So the build your own sandwich menu is similar to a flowchart, and it walks the customer 
through their choices. So other examples of information architecture are tables of contents at the beginning of books or an index at the back of books. So the goal of IA is to design a structure that helps the users navigate through the information that's contained within the system. So one of your tasks as a designer is to determine what should that information architecture be. So if you wanna create amazing UX, it's not enough to just create a navigation bar and it just takes the user to every major table in the solution. So this is what I talk, what I mean when I talk about moving away from list and form view. So doing just a bunch of tables is kind of a more or less lazy way to present the data. So that might be the correct way, but there might be a more meaningful way. We want to interpret that data for the user, make it easier for them to evaluate it, make connections, and take decisions. So your job is to structure the information in a way that helps the user do this. So there's often a bunch of different ways that you could build the information architecture. So this is the initial information architecture, the initial, uh, the original screen, so the initial information architecture that I started with. So at the top level, you can see there's, again, the global navigation, you know, contacts, notes, to-dos, uh, quotes, publications, and reports, which is not a table probably, but, uh, and also the menu. But other than that, I believe there are records underneath each of those that correspond to the tabs. So uh, we can visualize the existing structure, something like this. I just I did a diagram just for context uh, to show you uh, what is here and from an informational perspective. So we could visualize it uh, like this. So uh, to-dos, proposals, and then the reports. So the to-dos and proposals were things that were identified in the how can we statements. They were things that they wanted to see more of. They were a high priority. So I put those at the top. And then company contact and notes, they're still you know, tables within the system. They're gonna have their same relationships from a data perspective that they did before, but they are less important uh, to the proposals, according to my understanding of this at the beginning, because it did change uh, from this. But this is where I started. Uh, another one you could do, I think this was another one. Uh, oh, no, sorry. This was how it eventually ended up. This was the final one. So I created, ended up creating a category named activities. And what I did was group the to-dos, the notes, and the email underneath activities. Now, I did create a table called activities and to do's notes and email are a type of record inside of that table for convenience sake, but you didn't that didn't need to be the way it was done. You could have just a label called activities that has no correlation in the data schema and to do's notes and email could be three different tables within that. So, uh, you know, I'm you know, just wanting to show you how the information architecture and the data architecture are not necessarily the same. So uh, for uh, campaigns, I ended up adding this campaigns and proposals because it turned out that uh, proposals needed to be held together, uh, you know, by something, and we called that a campaign. So maybe it was like a different number of quantities or, you know, different, um, different brands, different magazines, they needed proposals to be all uh, tied under the same umbrella. Maybe it was a time of year, an event or something, and it was different proposals that were covering different types of things for the same, for the same client. So that was where campaigns came from, and that wasn't on the original interface. So the next thing you wanna do is really learn all you can about the user because you cannot create an amazing user experience without connecting authentically with your users. So you need to thoroughly understand who they are, what they hope to achieve, and you need to do this yeah. to design the best workflow for them. So it's really about writing, writing good user uh, stories. And this is also the part where you create the workflows in workflow-based design. So you conduct interviews to get to know the users better. And the goal of these is to create a comprehensive list of user stories. And if you don't know what they are, they're just simply descriptions of the feature, but from the point of the view of the user, and they include the reason for that feature. So you write them like this as a, and then you fill in their role. In this case, it's salesperson. I want, and then you fill in what their goal is in this case, they want to be able to create uh, to create a contact record, and so that and that's the reason why. Now, this particular reason is not super earth shattering, but there are times when that reason is will actually change the way in which you end up 
um, implementing that feature because it changes your understanding of what it is. And that's why I don't really like to do lists of features because it kind of lacks that understanding of what the, un what the un underlying goal is for that feature. So I create these in Trello. I create a big long list. I go through them with the, with the customer. I, that's what I also use to estimate. I assign story points to them and then I convert those story points to hours later. The customer can uh, also prioritize them, tell you which ones are must-haves, which ones are nice-to-haves. So if they if you do pro have a problem with scope, you know, those nice-to-haves, which might have been included at the beginning, they may actually be pushed out of the first phase of development because there's not enough uh, budget to actually get to them. But that's going to be their choice. That's going to be on them if they choose to do that. So I also create a little title. I give it a, you know, because sometimes it's a lot of words for the user story. They're hard to read when the card is collapsed. So I create a title of, you know, for this one is create a company contact record. So very straightforward. And I also do acceptance criteria. So um, this is all of that information that you want to capture about, you know, let's say there, if there was mandatory fields or business rules that needed to be followed, they would go in here. This particular one is just very straightforward. It's, it's very minimal. Uh, often I will write a little bit more than this, but just something to capture, you know, what is going to be part of this user story so that when you're estimating it, you know uh, really what, how it's going to be working. The other thing is to uh, create workflow diagrams. So I do this, I often will do this to get an understanding of the client's process uh, to begin with. So this may be a description of what they're doing today and or it could be a description of their future state. So these workflow diagrams would correspond to uh, their stories. And you don't necessarily need to do one for everyone, but the more complex ones you do want to flesh out because that's where the nasty surprises are hiding. And you want to have a really good idea of how that feature is going to work. What are the steps involved? This also gives something concrete for you and the client to look at and agree on. So that aids in that transparency piece and our aids in heading off problems. It also becomes a lot easier to uh, estimate your work effort once you've done all of this pre-work. So this actually can be really valuable to the client because as an organization, they may have never consciously thought through the process before ever, right? So having it documented is quite valuable apart from all of its other uses. So John Matthewson from Keologic uh, took this training with his entire team. They were awesome students, by the way. Uh, he said, the solid focus on user stories and acceptance criteria deepened my appreciation of the benefits from careful design planning. While we'd always paid attention to this area, Alexis raised our understanding and skills to a new level. This will lead to better results for clients from the outset. So again, they were a really great team, very dedicated, and it was really a lot of fun to teach them. So now you can start on step three, visualizing how your project is going to look. So you've done quite a bit of research at this point. So you probably have some idea of how it might go together, but um, you could also create wireframes. So a wireframe is basically a sketch of the initial, your initial ideas, and it's just using lines, shapes, and text. Now, if it's just for you, you could even do this on a piece of paper. I mean, you could scan it and share it with the client if you wanted to. Uh, it's up to you uh, what context you use this, but it is really helpful to get your ideas out. And one benefit of doing it on uh, in a program, let's say like balsamic mockups, is that if you want to change things, you can move the components around really easily rather than scratching out and redrawing. But it depends on the context. You know, if you're sitting in front of the client, sometimes the easiest thing to do is to just start drawing in a piece of paper and that's fine. I could keep a sketch pad, you know, just for that. So you want to experiment with different possible designs. One thing that's really great is you don't have to, in order to represent the design, you don't need tables, fields, relationships, portals, button states, none of that. All you need is just rectangles and colors. It's so much simpler to build something. And if you're doing a high fidelity wireframe, it can look pretty much exactly how it's gonna look in FileMaker. So this is where you can validate those potential designs and validate your workflows as well without investing a ton of time. So if you are used to doing it in FileMaker, once you learn uh, how the uh, tools work, it's not that difficult. Something like uh, Balsamic Wireframes or Adobe XD, uh, those are a lot faster because there's just a lot less you know, moving parts. And this allows you to actually spend more time trying out different options. You're not as married to your first idea as quickly because you put in a lot of effort to create something. 
So there are two kinds of wireframes. So there's low fidelity and high fidelity. So low fidelity means it just doesn't look a lot like the actual software. It's really very much of a sketch. I like this because it conveys to the client the idea, these are ideas. These are not fully fledged um, solutions. We're not giving you something that looks very finished. We're purposely showing you something so that we can talk about it, so that you can criticize it if need be, or say, you know, it's a lot easier for clients to talk about something when they have something to refer to. They are not used to abstracting the way that we are. So they're not used to, you know, thinking about data relationships and screens in their heads. They don't have that experience. So creating a very quick sketch that can take you five minutes is really, really helpful. So um, this was really just to validate the details. And I started here experimenting with the idea of having a central dashboard, or more, I call it actually better name is home screen, where the user logs in so they can have quick access to those to do's and proposals. So the final result really looked quite different in the end, but that's totally fine. It's just really meant to be a starting point so that you can have those converse, conversations. So here's another wireframe of the company screen. And these are the only two that I did in any detail because I assumed that once we had these nailed down, we were going to um, be able to use them as a model for the other, um, for the rest of them. So I didn't actually do every single screen in the wireframe, although you could. So here's the high fidelity mock-up I created for that screen we just looked at. And as you can see, it looks you know, pretty similar to what it might look like in FileMaker. So here's the comparison of the two. So if I started with something you know, that looked like the one on the right, it would be a lot harder for the client to feel like they could change it. You know, like it feels more locked in at this point. So uh, if, if there's nothing existing at all, then uh, it's nice to do um, to do a wireframe, like a low fidelity wireframe so that they have something to talk about. So I don't know if people ever do wireframes. You can let me know in the chat if this is something that you have ever done before. I guess Bob probably has, but <laughs> we don't count you, Bob. <laughs> Um, all right, so another time saver is having a repertoire of design patterns at your fingertips. So when you encounter design problems, you don't need to reinvent the wheel a lot of the time or tear your hair out for that matter. Mo many, if not most common software problems already have solutions and these are called design patterns. So they're solutions that you can adapt for your own purposes, but you need to know what they are and when best to use them. So let's take the FileMaker UI as an example. So there are a number of different design patterns at work here. So you've got uh, buttons here, navigation tabs, sort by column. You've got a modal window, which is also a design pattern and you have a list entry. So that's just to name a few. So the more design patterns you know, the more effectively you can create amazing UX because you'll be using the right tool for the job. And it becomes even more powerful when, as you see here, you start to combine the design patterns together. So that creates a highly functional interface. So if you've never thought about design patterns before, it's worth learning about the common ones, what problems they solve, and when to use them. So now we come to visual design, and this is often what people think of when they think about design, but as we've seen today, the visual design is only really a fraction of what goes into designing an amazing user experience. But it's still a really good idea to familiar, familiarize yourself with visual design principles. So I think it's best to keep things simple, especially if you're new to visual design, uh, but let's look at some of the most common principles that I use that I think are the most important. So the first is visual hierarchy. So the hierarchy communicates the relative order of importance of a piece of information. And that is compared to the other information that's in your app. And this helps users make sense of the information on the page. It allows them to pick out sections that they wanna focus on and scan and read and really find what they're looking for quickly. If you look at the example on the right, it's just a big block of text. It's much harder to pick out one piece of information. Grouping is another really important one. So people, the way humans perceive, uh, just it's called gestalt uh, psychology, uh, and it's really a, a, a theory of perception, a human perception. The way we perceive objects is that 
objects that look similar and are close together uh, in, in proximity, we assume that they're a group or they're similar in some way. So we can use this to our advantage. So we can use grouping to categorize, divide and organize the information on the layout so that it makes sense to the user. However, if we do this and we're not thinking about grouping, we can sometimes group unrelated information and that can be a problem um, because then people jump to the wrong conclusion, right? So we want to, you know, make sure that if we have fields and labels, they're close enough that people, uh, so that they, sorry, that they appear related and we're not getting confused. We want to use the grouping to really organize that information on the screen. So next is balance. So balance is the proportion of symmetry versus asymmetry. So in general, symmetrical placements of objects is more pleasing, but you know, humans are complicated. And uh, if we have excessive symmetry, it can actually be boring. Uh, a lot of the time, we're not gonna be able to achieve perfect symmetry anyway, because say the length of the data that's gonna be in every record will be slightly different. So we wanna really achieve a, a sense of balance. It doesn't have to be perfectly symmetrical, but it feels balanced. So there's not you know, objects crowded on one side with lots and lots of space on the other. Uh, and you know, you know, this is really um, a way of, you can look at your um, layouts and really tell at a glance, do they feel balanced by just thinking about, uh, you know, where, is, where are, the, are the objects clustering? So unity is the sense that a design forms a cohesive whole. So there are different components that go into a, uh, an interface and there are, you know, text, there's buttons, uh, there's all kinds of different objects, but unity is the sense that they all go together, that they, you know, that they belong together. If you see the uh, example on the right, it just looks like a bunch of clip art taken from different places and not really, there's no sort of unifying uh, idea. The colors are not unified, really nothing is. So uh, unity is sort of an emergent property. When you use all the design principles together effectively, you often will uh, end up with something that looks unified. So color, this is the hardest one for most people. And they also wanna you know, often ask me, what about color combinations? I really recommend that less is more. You can create a successful UI with just one color and maybe an accent color. The majority of it is gonna be white or gray, something neutral that is in the background. And uh, you just wanna be consistent and you avoid the so-called angry fruit salad look. Contrast is the amount of difference between different kinds of elements. So it can be color, but it can also be size um, and uh, you know uh, style, different contrasts. But if we have too much contrast, it can be jarring. So if you think about maybe like a, war a traffic warning sign, which is like black on yellow, like the highest contrast that you could have, if you had that on your screen staring you in the face all day, that would be really hard on your eyes, right? So we don't want to have too much contrast. But often what I see is a lack of contrast. So you'll have gray on gray, and this is really difficult to read. Uh, and it also is kind of dull looking. So we want to avoid uh, too little or too much contrast. Next is white space. So white space really refers to all the space that we would call the background. So things that surround the objects, that what the uh, objects seem to be sitting on on the screen. And we want to have enough of this so that uh, objects can stand out and they improve the legibility uh, and the understanding of the layout. So uh, when everything is sort of crowded together, there's not a lot of white space, it's a lot harder to read and make sense of. So there's this theme, right, of being able to uh, lead the user through, help them make sense of what they're uh, after and being able to help them find what they're looking for quickly. So white space helps us do that. Consistency is really important. So. Uh, we want consistency in terms of behavior and look. Uh, this really enables the users to understand quickly uh, what an interface means. If they go to a different part of the system, they can understand it's consistent. So it's gonna work the same over there. So, and it also makes uh, your, um, your uh, layout look a lot more professional and polished. 
Last one I'm going to talk about today is alignment. So if you have alignment, uh, which is sort of mostly on the left, because we in this uh, culture read from left to right, uh, aligning text allows people to scan along the margin really uh, easily, and also alignment within the page as well, so that things are not just sort of haphazardly placed. And you remember we talked about balance and unity before, so alignment and consistency will help you achieve that. All right, so all of these principles work together. So this is the uh, high fidelity mock-up that I showed you earlier. Uh, you, you wanna have lots of white space. There's not a ton of color. There's a little bit of color in terms of the accent. And uh, you know, overall, it looks pretty balanced. So I took all of these examples in this section from a uh, free downloadable resource that I have on my website. It's uh, called a visual design cheat sheet. So you can download it for free. You can go to fmdesignuniversity.com and click on resources and download the PDF. So last but not least, certainly not least, uh, let's talk about usability. So usability uh, is really evaluated by five key quality components. And these are from the Nielsen Norman group. So the first is learnability. So how easily can new users perform the tasks? The next is efficiency. So it's great to um, design for new users, but what about experienced users? How quickly can they achieve their goals? Memorability, how easily can users pick up where they left off? Remember uh, how to use it after a period of time of not using it anymore. And finally, errors. Oh, sorry, not finally. Second, finally, errors. How well does the design handle errors? So how easily can they recover when a problem happens? The last one is satisfaction. So how much do they like using the design? So these are the factors we use to assess usability. And you need to be thinking about these qualities and making sure that they're incorporated into your design. So um, there are uh, eight usability principles. There's a number of different lists out there, but I like the one from Debbie Stone. And it's in a book called User Interface Design and Evaluation. And she has eight user, uh, usability principles. And I'll go through them briefly now. The first is visibility. So it should be obvious what the possible actions are. The user should not be surprised when they click a button. You want things to be clear. The second is affordance. So affordance is the quality uh, of an object that um, allows you to understand that you can use it. So the classic example of uh, affordance is a pair of scissors. So when you pick them up, there are two holes uh, for your hands and you naturally want to put your hands into them and open and close uh, your fingers, right? So on the screen, what that translates into is uh, being able to communicate to the user that they can click on something or that something will happen when they take an action. So you can think of a button hover state as the uh, classic example of this. So we want to allow people to to know that uh, you know here's an object you can use and it will uh, do this thing. Next is feedback. So the system should be clear and it should use user-friendly language when providing feedback to the user. So I mean, who likes likes getting a, you know a 404 error, right? We don't know what happened. We don't know uh, how long it's going to last. What should we do next? We want to kind of avoid, whenever possible, those generic messages and really make things friendly. A lot of times, people feel actually even ashamed when they make a mistake in the software, even though it's really not their fault. Um, and so we don't want to make them feel bad. We want them to feel good when we're when they're using our software. Number four is simplicity. So we want to keep things task focused. So that's when we say simplicity, we don't mean not feature rich. What we mean is focused on a task and allowing the user to be efficient when they're using your app. So you want to boil the processes down into the fewest number of steps. Next is structure. So your UI should reflect the real world structure of the information in language that's familiar to the user. So you want to organize it logically. If someone was familiar with that domain, it would make sense to them how the app is organized. It should match what they know about their own processes. And again, consistency. So it's one of the most important usability principles because it impacts learnability so much. You want to aim for consistency in how it looks from screen to screen, how it behaves, and also be consistent with, again, the real world processes. 
Seventh is tolerance. So we wanna prevent user errors as much as we can, but if they do happen, we want to allow the users a way out. You want to avoid putting them in a position where they can easily make a mistake or make damaging permanent changes by accident or end up in some sort of uh, dead end, right? They're only human after all, so we want to promote tolerance. And last but definitely not least is accessibility. We want to eliminate as many barriers for users as possible with the tools that we already have at our disposal. So this means, for example, designing for people who are colorblind, which are, there's a quite a high number. I think it's 8% of, of males of European descent have colorblind. So there's going to be in any largest company, a number of people who may not be able to distinguish certain colors from one another. Uh, I talked about lack of contrast. That's another problem for people with low vision. And I think, you know, we could bump up. We don't necessarily have a ton of accessibility tools, but we should definitely be using them when we can. And we don't want it to just be an afterthought. So I use the example of subtitles. So originally when subtitles came out, you know, uh, the text at the bottom of a, of a movie, they were really meant for people with a hearing impairment. And they were done as a concession, you know, to, to people who are hearing impaired and being able to not hear the audio. But I use them all the time. Like when I'm watching a show like uh, Peaky Blinders, for example, where they're speaking in a very thick accent, I have to put on the subtitles and read them. And I don't think anybody would want to do away with subtitles today, right? You wouldn't want to get rid of them. If I'm in a quiet place and I want to you know, watch a video, I am depending on those subtitles with the sound off. So just remember, we're all one accident away from needing to use these accessibility features ourselves. So we really should be thinking about them more. So here are the eight usability principles in a list. So each of these are critical to good usability and each of them has an effect on the quality components of usability that we mentioned before. So you need to design with these principles in mind. And if you do that, your app will actually end up looking pretty good, right? It will be, it will have that emergent quality of usability uh, and then it will have the aesthetics will kind of just come out of that because you've been following all of these principles. So here's some feedback from uh, student Matina. So before taking the workflow design workshop, I could identify that I liked or didn't like a particular design, but I wasn't always sure why. The course gave me the language to explain why a design works or not. Now I'm looking at websites and apps differently, and I have a very good foundation that will allow me to dive deeper into various design topics. So today I've tried to give you a taste of some of this language so that you can take these concepts back and start to notice them more and apply them in your own work. So let's wrap up our case study for today. So as a reminder, this is the original solution and this is the final home screen. So I ended up reorganizing uh, a bunch of things and this is how it ended up. But we still have all of the to-dos uh, under the title of activities and uh, campaigns, which are proposals at the top. And then we ended up adding companies and contacts at the higher level as well. So this was the original lo-fi mockup that I had in uh, Balsamic Wireframes. And then this was the uh, hi-fi mockup that I did, and it sort of changed a lot between version one and version two. And this is the final version that I actually built again. So let's just take a look at these three sort of uh, side by side. So you can see that the idea of having a central home screen remained the same, but the information architecture changed a few times. And this wasn't because I felt like changing it, it was based on conversations that I had with the client and what was important to them. So if you imagine that I had just started by building the first solution in that first mock-up, you know, I would have missed out on all of that evolution and discovery that I made between the first and the last versions. So here's the final company's view. And this is the lo-fi uh, mock-up for the companies the hi-fi, and then the final one again. So this is what they, what they looked like. So you can see things shifted a lot from first version to final version. Okay, so um, 
just before I wrap up, I want to show you another real world redesign project I did. So this is a recreation of their original interface. And the solution had been in use for a while and had kind of lost its way. I don't know if it ever had that much of a way, but it definitely sort of went sideways over time and it was quite hard to use. And it makes sense because it's not following a lot of the concepts that I was talking about today. And here's the redesigned interface. So it might be hard to believe because it was hard for me to believe, but everything that was on that old interface is here on the new one. And I had to check a bunch of times to make sure that everything was represented, but we ended up doing a very detailed inventory of each feature on that old interface. Uh, and I made sure that it was transferred to the new interface. We had meetings with the clients. I created a high, um, I created user stories, some workflow diagrams, and then high fidelity mockups. So essentially that new one is just reorganized and presented and prioritized differently than them before. And of course, you know, I followed the visual design and usability principles that we talked about. So this is the power of workflow based design. So I wanna leave you with this famous quote from Steve Jobs. Design is not just what it looks like and feels like, design is how it works. So what this really means is that how it looks is a byproduct of how it works and not the other way around. And that's why I'm so big on the workflow design framework. So remember what I said earlier about usability being about people and processes, not about technology. So trying to make something look good after the fact is the wrong approach. So when you start with design, you too can create amazing UX without tearing your hair out. So thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation. I hope it was helpful. If you're interested in the course, please go uh, to FM Design University and click on course. So I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you all. And if you have questions, please let me know. Let me just get out a keynote here for a second. All right, I'm back. Uh, I don't know if I, if I understand that one, Eric. Maybe you can tell me what that means. Thanks. Uh, for design, uh, research, oh. <laughs> visual. <laughs> I love it. Oh, you got me. <laughs> Oh, I may, I may need to like, I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to think about it. <laughs> I was trying to think of is there an acronym for that. No, I'll have to. <laughs> uh, well, <not> really. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. Well, hopefully it makes sense to you, right? Wonderful. Great presentation. Oh, thanks, Karen. Do people do wireframes? Does anybody else do them? I'm curious. I'm tempted to show you one of mine because I use FileMaker, but I make it look like chicken scratch and cartoon pond. So it's kind of funny. Uh, yes, angry fruit salad. We call the same thing pizza. Yes, <laughs> it's very true. Oh, Jake, Jake does it. Well, Jake works at Angel City, so he does it all the time. That's cool. Yeah, I've used Balsamic quite a bit. And it's definitely helpful. Yeah, it really is. It really is about having that conversation and being able to work things out without spending a ton of time. What I like about Balsamic too is it's relatively easy to learn. Sometimes it took me a little while to learn something like XD. Um, it was a little bit harder. You can do a lot with it, but of course, you know, the more flexible something is and the more complicated it is, the harder it can be to learn. So there's a bit of a learning curve there. Balsamic is pretty much, you know, point and click, right? And you don't have to be too precise. You can be pretty loose with it when you're using it. So that's good. Balsamic crew represent. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Although I think it is with a Q. They made it different. I don't really know what the Q is for, but uh, they, they spelled balsamic with a Q instead of a C, I guess, just to be different. All right. Well, I hope people will um, actually learn more about this. I get asked, uh, you know, a lot of times about things like design patterns. Uh, Daniel, you're out of correct. Um, you know, if you don't, if you haven't heard about them, um, please go ahead and, and, you know, do some reading. There's lots and lots of information out there that's free that you can uh, learn and read about design patterns. Um, and yeah, usability is, is really the, the most important thing. So if you aren't thinking about usability, please do so. If you have any comments about that, please let me know as well. Thanks. Quick, tie Ben here. Tie in with the with um, Bob's 
great presentation earlier. Um, I was interested in, because there was a talk about documentation and then you were talking about your documentation. And so you share that with the client, right? But that's, that's a very different kind from sort of technical documentation, but actually maybe perhaps more useful to the client in the end. Yes, so um, they will probably focus on the user stories, right? Uh, in a way, it's this very similar approach to, to Bob. You're sort of doing a technical side and a client facing side. Um, the client will, will probably focus a lot on the stories and then the developers will tend to focus on the acceptance criteria because the acceptance criteria are kind of instructions of how this feature is supposed to work, right? So there may be some things you don't know about it. Um, you know, I have to make an API call. You might not know what the, that API looks like. There may be some details missing from that, but you can you know that something is there. You can put a placeholder in and you can build out, you know, a um, list of things that they need to take care of. Um, I'm not sure who's buzzing there. Um, anyway, somebody can. <laughs> Someone's busting. <Not> me. <laughs> All right, I'll just talk over it. Uh, so yes, so basically, you can use those those acceptance criteria as a guidepost and a guideline for how you're going to build it, and then um, you can fill in the details once you're into the project. At the beginning, of course, you're just going to have to estimate, but um, you can flesh those out more and more as you get more details. Uh, so that's how I do it. And I share all that and I actually do it with them. So it's an activity that we do together. And um, I might, you know, take away and build more notes or something if, if there's, you know, too much that I can't transcribe in that one session. But I do this with them. And then uh, I never print it and give it to them. I usually give them access to the Trello board. That way, they're also part of the prioritization um, um, uh, activity as well. So they're prioritizing things with you or they're telling you what their high, what highest priority is and they're in charge of what that scope is, right? So if they don't like your number, you know, they can they can adjust the scope if, if that's uh, what they wanna do. Eric, I think you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, oh, I'm getting, getting just a sec. Someone's dialing. I'll go away. Okay. Um, yeah, question, because we have this, one of these, our layouts kind of looks like yours, but even worse, there's lots of portals and information data all over the place. And it's kind of grown over like 15 years worth of development where, um, you know, it started out maybe simpler, but then they wanted to see more data side by side and it just kept growing and growing. And every time I asked, hey, could we get rid of this or could we reorganize this? Pretty much the way you describe, you know, let's, let's do this by task or by, you know, by use case and we're because you couldn't possibly be looking at all this data at the same time. You're maybe comparing one thing to another thing, but you can't, nobody sits there and compares, you know, 50 pieces of data together all at once. And uh, every time I, <laughs> it, they can never agree to, to do something like that, even on a, just for a specific task. And if I've ever tried to take, change that or take that layout away, um, I get a lot of protests and we created another one that was, you know, included almost as much information, but kind of modularized it a little bit, you know, tab controls and things like that. And, and the only people we could get using were the evaluators. This is a university. And they, so the evaluators, because an evaluator designed it actually. And so they got their evaluators to use it. And so that kind of worked, but we couldn't get anybody else to, to you to agree to do something similar. Is, do you have any strategies for like gradually moving people over or just yet, do you have to just jerk the chain and <laughs> pull them all over well, to something? Yeah. Else? <laughs> it depends, it depends where they're at, you know, how much sure they are as an organization. To some extent, it depends on the politics of it. For example, you know, are the users just being told that they have to change and, you know, buy somebody up higher up? Um, and sometimes they're a bit more resistant. A lot of it is change management, right? So, uh, you know, being able to bring people along to support the change and to um, be able to adopt it actually once once it's uh, in production, because it's one thing for them to tell you, I need to do this and that, and then you go in and then there's nothing but complaints. So you have to bring the right people in from the beginning. I find a lot of times they need to talk to each other Right. So part of what happens is, especially if you've been a developer that's been talking directly with the users for a long time and they're used to calling you up and saying, hey, Eric, uh, it's Eric, right? 
Uh, yeah. Hey, Eric, can you add me a button on the screen? And, um, you know, you got to print this report. Can you do that for me? And you're like, yeah, sure. I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. So, so that's great. On the one hand, you're being responsive, you know, you're giving them really, really fast and good service. On the other hand, they are now in charge of designing the interface, right? You've kind of in some ways handed over the ability for them to just kind of say, I want this, I want that. So they're now solutionizing on your behalf. So I don't let my clients do that. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to handle it, but what I really try to do is get them to focus on telling me what they want to achieve. So what do you want to achieve? Now, if you're not the only person in this department doing this job, then all of you all of you need to get together. Maybe we all have to have a conversation and agree on what the uh, goal is. Like, so let's forget about for a moment how we're gonna achieve this goal. What is the goal, right? That's why I'm talking so much about workflow-based design and goals because people get really super attached to like that placement of that button in that spot. And I think a lot of it is the fear that they're not going to know or their, their lives are going to get harder because they're not going to know how their system works or something's going to change. And, you know, they've got this muscle memory for this thing that's in this place. And if it moves, it's going to be a problem. And maybe they feel that their voice isn't going to be heard or like everybody in the department is coming to you behind everybody else's back asking for this and that. And it contradicts what someone else wanted. Like these are all possible. I don't know if this is describing you. But what I try to do is get them together as a group who are doing a function, have a discussion about, okay, what are your goals shared, your shared goals? Because you're not just doing this for one user, right? You're doing it for everybody. So if you make a change, it's going to affect everyone. But if they all feel that they have the possibility to chime in, and it's not just going to be one person, let's say you, right, telling them what to do, right? they are maybe more willing to uh, to kind of engage with that. The other thing I do is sometimes what I'll do is I'll draw something. So if we say to them, what if we did it like this and you can pop up a modal and it'll look like that. And they're like, they cannot envision that a lot of the time, right? Their eyes start to glaze over. They may or may not know what you're talking about. So what I do, like for that one I just showed at the end, I just did a, a high fidelity mock-up for them. In the beginning because they already had an existing solution they didn't want to change anything about it they needed to just replace what was there and they're like oh my god we love this right so that just it just got around that whole conversation right they're like oh so that is one solution i mean obviously that's a big redesign right there as a company they were prepared for that um so you, they're not always so i i find it hard to just incrementally change something. That's probably the most difficult thing to do because you're running up into what you're discussing. As soon as you move something, it has a chain reaction and everything else is gonna to start to change. So what I would personally advise you to do is maybe just have some conversations about different people, you know, and say, you know, what is the goal of this layout? You know, every layout should really have one main goal and then maybe a couple of ancillary goals if they fit. But if you have like three or four or five main goals, well, wait a second, people are, like you said before, people are not pursuing five goals at the same time, right? So if you give, you know, five goals, but they're a click away, so each of those five goals, let's say, is at the top because they're all super important. And if you switch from one to the other, all you have to do is click a button. And then now you have something that's perfectly optimized for that new goal. Isn't that better than just hunting around, you know, your screen for the one thing that you need some of the time, right? So if you, I, well, I don't want to bring my screen up again, but the other one, I ended up putting the invoicing stuff in a tab because it was on the front and center, but that 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 uh, screen was really for customer service representatives to manage their project. So they put in the billing stuff at the beginning and then they pretty much never looked at it again, right? So if there's something wrong, if accounting calls them and says, hey, you know, there's something wrong with the billing, they can click on billing and it's right there. But in their face, day after day, when what they do need are like related projects, you know, who's the salesperson on this, like all this other stuff, that's what they want to see, right? So I don't know, this is a long answer. I hope I answered your question and gave you something to think about. Does that make sense? Great. Thank you. Okay. All right. I think we're just coming on to one o'clock. So um, unless there's any last minute questions, I think we're going to wrap it up for this month. Um, thank you very much, Alexis. That was really great, great presentation. People got a lot out of it. And um, just a reminder that if you have something you want to share for next month, Barry is um, open to uh, hearing from you. So get in touch with him. And uh, 
Otherwise, we will see everyone next month. Okay. Thanks so much for everybody for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it Thank, was you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Right, take care.